listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Are these the last days, metaphorically speaking, of Boris Johnson's prime ministership? You can vote now on a poll that is breaking all records on that. Are these the last days, literally speaking, of the world-renowned, world-historic journalist and publisher Julian Assange, who had a stroke on Friday, yet still lies, an unconvicted man, in the maximum security hellhole of Belmarsh Prison. Are President Joe Biden's best days behind him? <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. Uh, and there's no poll on that because it would all be one way. Are these the last days of Ghislaine Maxwell? At least the last days that are not spent behind bars. We'll be talking to the woman, Kirby Summers, who's done so much to break this story, to spread this story about how the trial's going. You need to listen to that because, hey, Twitter have closed down most of the other means of finding out what is being said, claimed and denied in that courtroom in New York City. We'll be talking, of course, about all of these matters. Under the shadow of the Prime Minister's address to the nation at 8 o'clock, it will be nothing like as interesting as my address to the nation in a minute or two. Fasten your seatbelts. It's the mother of all talk shows. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. This is Radio Sputnik. A block of wood is currently nine points clear of the Conservative Prime Minister Boris Johnson, despite him having an 80-seat majority in the House of Commons, though he may not have 80-seat majority after Thursday when there is a very real live possibility of a rock-solid Conservative seat falling to the Liberal Democrats, not least because parties to the right of the Conservatives are going to take thousands of Conservative votes because, frankly, more and more people have concluded that whatever else he is, Boris Johnson is not, in fact, a Conservative. He's a bounder, he's a cad, he's a mountbank, he should have been horsewhipped before he even got into public life, should have been horsewhipped out of it by many an angry father, father-in-law, cuckolded husband, by people that trusted him and found their trust misplaced, betrayed, any number of people told us, did tell us that Boris Johnson was a thoroughly disreputable cove and was only conservative as long as it fitted him, and it no longer seems to fit him. The question of open borders on the Channel coasts, the question of repeated lockdowns and restrictions, uh, the stealth taxing of us through green taxes, since Boris Johnson slipped into a polar bear suit up in Glasgow at COP26, the betrayal of the North over HS2, the whole stamp of Boris Johnson's Conservative government is actually of a Blairite liberal. That's why I've been saying to you throughout all of this two years, those idiots, half-wits, who kept describing Boris Johnson's government stuffed to the gills with gays and ethnic minorities, pursuing the fads of greenery, pursuing every fad of COVID-19, 
People said it was the most right-wing Tory government we've ever had, even called them fascists. They're not even conservatives, never mind fascists. If you think that is fascist, you need to study more. If you think that's a right-wing government that we have at Westminster, you obviously are too young to remember Margaret Thatcher, Norman Tebbit, in their boots, kicking the working people of this country all over the shop. But the majority of Conservative MPs are not like that. Or at least they're not like that if they think it's going to cost them their seats and they're going to discover on Thursday in North Shropshire that the Conservative voters don't really like it very much. They don't like the fact that the boats keep arriving on the beach. They don't share the perspective of people like me, that however bad that is, deplorable that is, avoidable that is, it's still a trickle compared to the numbers of migrants, asylum seekers, call them what you will, that are arriving in France, in Greece, in Germany, a trickle compared to the numbers that are arriving in Turkey, in Pakistan, in Iran. The conservative voting base doesn't see it that way. They see boatloads of young fighting age men arriving on the Channel coasts and being hustled away in a taxi to a three or even four star hotel which is no longer bookable by the ordinary holidaymaker or traveler in Britain, they see an endless, apparently, with a 64% success rate in the claims for asylum, a bill that will run forever. That's not what they voted for when they voted for Brexit. The conservative voting base does not like all this greenery, doesn't want to scrap its boiler, doesn't want to have to buy an electric car by 2030, only eight years from now, doesn't want to pay increased taxes, to wrap ourselves in the green tinsel of extinction rebellion, doesn't like the fact that the Metropolitan Police stands by while people nail themselves to the motorways and bring everything to a halt. The conservative voting base didn't vote for that or at least didn't think that that's what they were voting for. And perhaps most troublingly, this country appears, and we'll know at eight o'clock, to be headed back to where we were last year at this time, at least for the most of us isolated, unable to see our elderly parents, unable to visit people in hospital, unable to bury people in funerals, unable to go to the pub, to the restaurant, to the club, to the football stadium. We may well be on the verge of a back to the future series of measures right after Christmas because Whatever else the government with its follow the science mantra is doing, it's not getting on top of what they say, and I'll come to that, is a clear and present danger to the National Health Service, to our public health, and even to the lives of very significant numbers of us. The problem is uh, they don't act as they speak which means one of two things. Either that what they speak is untrue and that they are deliberately hyping a danger which doesn't exist. If it did exist, why are they frolicking in Christmas parties in Downing Street when the rest of us were cowering behind the sofa, afraid even to kiss our elderly mothers while they were kissing each other? under the mistletoe. So you can't have it both ways. Either what they were saying wasn't true or we've actually got certifiable maniacs running the country, knowing the risks, but locking themselves in, 
number 10 Downing Street and laughing about it as memorable footage of Austin Allegra showed in the course of this past week. You can't have it both ways. Either it is the plague revisiting us and you're crazy, or it isn't quite the plague that you've been telling us, and that's why you were snogging each other. Even the Minister of Health was snogging his aid caught on CCTV in the Ministry of Health at a time when he was telling the rest of us we couldn't bury our elderly, we couldn't go to funerals or weddings, we couldn't visit people. He had his tongue down the throat, forgive me, of his parliamentary aide, somebody else's wife at that, I'll add. So when they tell us that the reason for this new panic, despite all the jabs we've had, I've had three now, but I'm supposed to panic about Omicron. Is that how you say it? Omicron, Omicron, which has killed zero people in the whole world, zero. It was identified in South Africa, and the woman, Dr. Coetzee, that identified it, has become hoarse telling us that whilst more transmissible, it is less deadly than the hitherto prevalent Delta version of the coronavirus. So numbers in South Africa of people infected has fallen three days in a row. In the last three days, it's fallen every day, despite a massive increase in the number of people tested. So fewer people are getting it in South Africa, and nobody yet has died of it anywhere in the world. So why are we running to the hills again? Why has Nicola Sturgeon completely devastated, again, the Scottish hospitality sector? Why is Boris Johnson hinting, threatening to do the same here in England? Why? If it's less deadly and more transmissible, then that means it's good news, not bad news. It's not as good news as the whole thing disappearing, but it's better news if a less deadly variant is becoming the prevalent one, or will become the prevalent one. But in any case, what about the next variant, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one? How long are we going to live like this with our economy devastated and people going mad? Don't tell me people are not going mad. I'm one of those that has the responsibility, the duty, the misfortune to read the comments on social media that emerge after programs like this. Trust me, there's tens of thousands of unhinged, deranged people out there. I had a woman tell me today that an anagram of Omicron and Delta is more media control. They're laughing at us, she said. She really meant it. Even when someone pointed out that mother-in-law is an anagram of Hitler woman, she didn't get the point. Anything can be an anagram of anything, but people have now reached the stage in this country and not just in this country. They don't believe a word the government or the state or its mandated media tell it. They don't believe it. More and more of them don't believe it. I walked for two hours or more in London this afternoon in Hyde Park, in Bayswater, in Queensway. Nobody was wearing masks. Nobody is following the instructions because they have lost faith, trust in the government. Not least because they've all seen the footage 
of the government making hay while the sun didn't shine for the rest of us. Nobody trusts Big Pharma, which won't release the patents, condemning billions of people in the poorest countries in the world to no vaccination at all unless they can afford it. Nobody believes that Big Pharma is disinterestedly telling us we need to have vaccination after vaccination after vaccination because people just hear the sound of the cash register ker and the undreamt of bounties which these pharmaceutical companies are banking. People don't trust the media because the media has become merely a font of official information. And if you stand against the tide, if you reveal what the state doesn't want you to know, you end up like Julian Assange, stricken, lying on this bitter evening on a hard bed in Belmarsh, found by the British courts are to be quite fit enough to go and face the rigors of 175 years in an American maximum security penitentiary where he will literally never be seen or heard from again. People see that. And journalists like the arrow that flies in the night sense of themselves, they tow the line. The fourth estate is no estate at all. Its imagined role as a sentinel subjecting official information to the same attention as the dog subjects the lamppost is all history now. Andrew Neil and the Sunday Times revealed the scandal that affected pregnant women all over this country. The thalidomide scandal was the great new thing. You were nobody if you weren't taking thalidomide when you were pregnant. It would banish morning sickness, anxiety, except it produced thousands of severely damaged children. It was punted by the same pharmaceuticals. It was trumpeted by the same kind of media, but at least then we had the insight team at the Sunday Times. Now we don't. Now there is no insight team. Now there is no Sunday Times meaningfully. There is no world in action. There are no journalists that are speaking up against the lies and the distortions and the hypocrisies until they decide that there's a need for a change of the Conservative Prime Minister. That won't mean they'll admit that they were wrong when they ensured the election of Boris Johnson in the first place. The Liberals in The Guardian and The Observer crying their crocodile tears over the premiership of Boris Johnson this day. Nobody did more to ensure Boris Johnson became prime minister than you, you lying hypocrites. But they have decided that Boris Johnson is no longer wanted on voyage. And for them, it's a glad, confident morning because They've never forgiven Brexit, you see. They would love to realign Britain with the European Union, rejoin it if they could. We are run by a collection of fools and knaves, ladies and gentlemen. Some of them fools and knaves at the same time. We are guarded by a fourth estate of charlatans. And the hero, Julian Assange, lies forgotten 
by that fourth estate in the media in Belmarsh jail this very evening. But I tell you objectively, as someone who's been in politics now for more than 50 years, on Thursday in North Shropshire, the death knell will sound for the premiership of Boris Johnson. What comes next? People say to me, who do you recommend? I wouldn't vote for any of them. But I am sure of one thing. Boris Johnson is an ex-Prime Minister. Are these the last days of Boris Johnson PM? You can vote on my Twitter feed, on my YouTube channel, and on my Telegram channel. Stay tuned, this is going to be, I promise you, the mother of all talk shows. Radio Sputnik. We asked you to help the podcast reach the magic number of 100 countries. I'm unusually proud of this, as you may be able to tell. And you answered the call. South Korea and Moldova took us over the hill with the Moats podcast now downloaded in 101 countries. Little old us in 101 countries. So if you're not already listening to this genuinely worldwide sensation, then please subscribe so you can listen to Moats anywhere, anytime from every corner of the earth. It's the distilled version of this show, shorn of all the peripheral material, just pure moats, 90 minutes instead of three hours. So if you do it and you love it, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're a Spotify user, please follow us and let us see when the next record broken will be. Tough questions are the most powerful weapon we have. As long as you have questions, we'll keep asking. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Get voting on the first of tonight's polls. Are these the last days of Boris Johnson PM? A, yes, B, no. You can vote on my Twitter feed, on my YouTube channel, or on my Telegram channel. Now, there will be extra time for telephone calls this evening. We've deliberately designed tonight's show because we think there will be, needs to be, maximum audience participation. So please carefully note these numbers. If you are calling from the United Kingdom, and please remember it's absolutely free, the number is 08081965522. That's 08081965522. Get your calls in now and we'll call you back when it is appropriate. And if you're in the United States, ditto, Get your calls in now. It's also toll-free in the United States and in Canada, and uh, it will cost you nothing. The number there is plus one, 844-944-3344. That's plus one, 844-944-3344. You can also tweet me at George Galloway at RTUK, and you can email the show on air at moats.tv. Now, Kevin Marr is our go-to man for events in Parliament, former parliamentary factotum himself, and connected to the political process in all kinds of ways. Kevin Marr joins me now. Uh, Kevin, you are a former Labour advisor. Are you surprised uh, that uh, Keir Starmer is nine points clear of Boris Johnson in today's opinion polls? Well, that was uh, the week that was, um, George. It's been a, a howler of a week um, for Boris Johnson. So I think it would be um, inevitable if there wasn't um, electoral polling ramifications um, for the week that he's had. And indeed, that, that's what we've seen in the last last 48 hours. We've seen, it, we've seen a slew of polls that have put a Labour lead now between four and nine points. So, so something... Something has changed this week. I think. I think. I think everybody can sense it. Um, it's not quite end of days um, for Boris Johnson. 
Um, that will come, I think, if enough of his backbench MPs feel that over a period of weeks or months, the government can't get its act together, that it's accident prone and that it's it's behind in the polls in a structural sense. And that 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 would therefore mean that they would lose their seats in any any forthcoming election. I think that's the point when his own side will um, move against him. And I think at some stage they definitely will. I mean, it, it was reminiscent of me uh, for me slightly um, this last week of um, that week that you'll be very familiar with in, in September 1992, um, um, when when uh, John Major's credibility uh, was smashed on the rocks on, on Black Wednesday. Um, and although he stayed in power for another four and a half years, uh, when that reckoning came in May 1997, uh, it virtually destroyed the Conservative Party. It was their worst ever election defeat in the 20th century. Um, the, so, so I think with, with governments, um, once you start slipping and sliding, you've got to either A, correct that very, very quickly uh, and be very bold in how you do that and recognise that you, you, you're slipping and sliding. Or it tends to just carry on. And if it carries on, then it becomes very, very difficult to re-establish trust and credibility, I think, with the electors. And I think, I think Boris Johnson has kind of forfeited um, so much trust and credibility this week with the revelations that have come out of the, the various parties and, and, and social gatherings and little tete-a-tetes that were taking place uh, in Downing Street and in other, in other government departments um, right at the time when, of course, the rest of us were being told to uh, socially distance, to not have parties, to not have gatherings, to not see our families and all the rest of it. And it's that double standard. It's that, that sense of just rampant hypocrisy, um, which is very, very damaging for, for any, any, any political leader. Um, and I think that's what stuck to him this week. And I think, I think from the Labour side, um, there's been a kind of scratching of heads for quite a long time about Boris Johnson. How do you land punches on this, this, very, um, this very strange political character that, that, that has won quite convincingly two years ago today, won an 80 seat majority? Um, the bumbling and the kind of affectations that, that he has, which, which uh, you know, been, made, made him very, very difficult to kind of characterise and attack. And I think what he's done this week is, is frankly, just, just do it to himself. Uh, and I think Keir Starmer's instinct is to sort of sit back a little bit, um, let him carry on slipping and sliding. He's got this um, review uh, into, these, into the allegations about these parties that the cabinet secretary is now obliged to, to undertake. There's got to be some conclusion to that. I think it's very hard to conclude anything other than parties took place and 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 you know people were at them and and, and who you know who knew about that. Um that's gonna stick and that's going to last um as 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 political damage. And one of the things that struck me so much this week is with you know, with one foot um outside the kind of the political camp. I mean, I, I look at my social media feeds and, and and family and friends and people who are not usually commenting on political matters. You know, everybody's been commenting on this. Everybody's been sharing these memes and these cartoons and these bits of footage about um, the parties in Downing Street. It's done real lasting damage. And I, th I think, there's, as I said, there's a palpable sense that something has changed this week. And if it's not immediate curtains for Boris Johnson, then this is the point, I think, at which um, his premiership is in a terminal stage. How much would a Conservative defeat on Thursday in North Shropshire affect the whole picture, Kevin? I, I think that really would bring things into focus. Now, I mean, on the numbers, you, you would say it's very difficult um, to, to see them um, any, doing anything other than holding that seat, um, probably with a very reduced majority, probably with a few squeaky moments um, over, over coming days, but it would be very hard to foresee um, the Conservatives losing that. If they did, if, if they were to lose it, then you know, all things are on the table, I think, at that point, because if you can lose places like that, uh, there, then all these other Conservative MPs, many of whom with very small majorities, those in the Red Wall areas in the north of England and in the East and West Midlands, um, they would be looking and saying, well, if we can lose places like in Shropshire, then my seats, you know, my seats, I'm a, I'm a goner. And at that point, it becomes very difficult to instill discipline in the, in the, in the parliamentary party. And I think that's going to take up a lot more time, regardless, um, for Boris Johnson this week. He's been, he's been very cavalier in his approach to being Prime Minister. He's very poorly briefed on, on pretty much any issue, doesn't do very much media, has obviously struggled with, with, with COVID and, and, and dealing with the fallout of Brexit and all the rest of it. And I think if he really had to try much harder to, um, to win around his parliamentary colleagues on, on, on lots of tight, tight votes that will, that will come up, then I think there comes a point for, for somebody like Boris that what do you actually enjoy about this job? Because governing is hard. 
Um, it's often very unglamorous. These are very long hours. Uh, lots of things can go wrong. Um, and I think there comes a point with, with characters like him that are kind of slightly kind of flibberty gibbet um, characters where, where they say, what is it that I enjoy about being prime minister? Because it probably isn't this. And I think that may hasten um, his departure as well. He may want to go at some stage under his own terms, perhaps saying, look, I've managed to see off COVID and secure Brexit. I've got my, my little place in history. Um, after that, what's the point in hanging around, really? Yes. Well, let's turn to one of those uh, type votes. Uh, there are scores of Conservatives already registered that they will not support uh, the uh, lockdown COVID measures uh, that uh, are coming up in the Commons this week. He would therefore lose that vote if it wasn't for the fact that Keir Starmer is going to support him, showing at the very least that he doesn't really have uh, the killer instinct, uh, Keir Starmer. Well, what's your take on that? I think Labour's in a bind because one of the, one of the great um, strategic weaknesses um, that the party's got and that, that Keir Starmer is, is, you know, probably rightly obsessed about is um, the sense of um, competence and acting in the national interest and all the rest of it. Now, now, perhaps that's a dilemma for all opposition parties. You're trying to prove that you should change positions with the governing party. So, so, so you want to try and emphasise your how seriously you take issues. Um, so I, th I think I think it's interesting to hear Labour politicians um, reference um, the support that they're likely to give the government this week on its on its kind of Plan B um, proposals for a sort of sort of soft low-fi lockdown. Um, they're, they're talking about backing the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor. They're, they're framing it very much in that sense that we're not backing Boris Johnson. We're not backing the health secretary. We're backing the, you know, the expert advisors. If their if their expert advice is that we need to take um, further measures um, to limit the transmission of, of um, Omicron, then then we'll do that. And if that you know means that we end up backing the government, then then you know that's the kind of the secondary motive. I think that's the uh, the kind of the kind of the, the Labour position. Um, but it's very interesting the fact that there are obviously lots of Conservative MPs that are very restive about this. Um, that, that have been very sceptical throughout about what measures are in fact needed and are any of these measures um, excessive to, to actually meeting the challenge. And I think there'll be a few of them that, we, that will be pondering whether um, the, the kind of um, the plan B measures that we've seen and, and Boris Johnson, of course, is due to address the British public uh, tonight. How much of this is theatre to, um, to try and uh, address what has been a very disastrous week politically? Um, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very dangerous game because, as I say, th these these two issues are intimately connected. That that um, you know, the people in Downing Street have been messing around um, with their parties last year, and then are asking us again to take fairly draconian measures ahead of Christmas. And for lots of people in the country, they will be saying, "Well, why should I?" Because you didn't do it. Um, and, and I'm not necessarily convinced that the measures are proportionate to the to the risk. So it, it, it starts to affect the you know the entire public health strategy. To be honest, um, and I think that um, there are a lot of Conservative MPs that are very very um, sceptical um, about how effective um, some of the lockdown measures have been. Uh, and if they decide to vote against the government this week, and, and Boris Johnson only survives because of the votes of Labour MPs, then again, it will add to a sense of malaise at the heart of government. Um, and it will put Boris Johnson and lots of his parliamentary colleagues on a different track, which again, starts to become very difficult to manage in the, in the weeks and months ahead, um, not only in relation to COVID, but to some of the Brexit issues that we're still dealing with, the Northern Ireland Protocol, for example, and some of the other um, difficult legislative issues that he's got as well. If, if, he's, if, he, if, if there's a chunk of his parliamentary party that ends up in a different place repeatedly, then some of these people might start to ask, um, is he the prime minister for us? Finally, Kevin, I'm grateful for your time as always. Let's uh, look into the crystal ball. Uh, Boris is no confidence or uh, decides that, frankly, this isn't worth the, the, the salary on which he can't live in any case. Certainly can't pay his alimony off that salary and bring up his growing family addition born this week, of course. Let's look into the crystal ball. If Boris either walked or was pushed, who would your money be on as the next Tory leader and thus prime minister for the next uh, two and a half years? 
It's a difficult one. Um, I think if you were to say what's the batting average of somebody that takes over as prime minister um, while the government, if you like, is, is in office, then you always always look to the chancellor and the foreign secretary as the, as the most likely candidates. So we, we're told uh, apparently today that Priti Patel, the home secretary, is 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 in the background, um, uh, sort of. Uh, on manoeuvres, as they say, um, with, with a view to a view to this as well. But I think if you look at people like you know Dominic Raab, um, you know they're not they're not compelling political figures. Um, the first Secretary of State, effectively Deputy Prime Minister. Um, you know, I, I think I think it is it is pretty thin gruel. I suspect uh, Rishi Sunak is seriously undercooked as as, as a political figure. Um, he seems very gauche. Seems very. Um, I think it would be very difficult for him to step up. I think I think the smart money at the moment might be on Sajid Javid. Now, as I say, the difficulty for him as health secretary is he's got an advantage and a disadvantage. His advantage is he, he does appear um, as a serious person, which which in a government of people who are not desperately serious sometimes um, sets him apart. The difficulty he's got is that, as I say, some of those um, backbenchers don't want any more of these lockdown measures, um, and Sajid Javid will 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 go with the scientific advice and, and, and bring them through. So it's a question, really, of of um, what's what's the um, what's the reason that Boris Johnson goes? Is it is it a sense of um, that he's just an unserious person, and therefore do you address that deficit with a serious person? And as I say, m my money would probably be on Sajid Javid. Uh, to fulfil that that role, or do they want an ideological figure um, to, to kind of um, take things forward? And well, you let know, me put a dark horse. Read. Let me put a, an ideological dark horse to you. The dog that didn't bark to uh, to mix the metaphors. Michael Gove hasn't been seen or heard of for some time. Uh, what about if he's uh, politically speaking drying out and getting ready for uh, and he's quite uh, uh, in the habit of uh, plunging in the uh, the political dagger. What about uh, Michael Gove seeking to take over, and very soon? Um, Michael, Michael Gove, I think, intellectually, and, and, and in many respects politically, is, is kind of head and shoulders above most of the cabinet. I think Michael Gove's difficulty, and, it, and it, I mean, it's, it's, a terrible, it's a terrible kind of reflection on, on the superficiality often of, of, of politics and presentational politics, he kind of just doesn't look the part. And that's, that seems a very blunt and very unfair assessment. But I, I'm, I'm reminded of exactly the same um, characterization of Robin Cook. Uh, you've in, taken in the, the words right years. out of my mouth. But Robin no, Cook Robin said Cook to looks me... looks like a garden gnome. Yeah, when I asked said. Robin, why don't you run? He said, uh, people think I'm too ugly. And I, yeah, looked, I, I, I looked across at John Major and I said, how handsome do you have to be? <laughs> it's ter it's terrible. It's it's so superficial. I mean, M Michael Michael Gove is, you know, a feline political operator, and and you know, intellectually smart and and, and perfectly capable. But but I think he's he he, he tends to kind of, you know, ha 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 he presents himself in a certain way, which which people draw very stark conclusions straight away. Is the kindest way of saying he's a bit ugly. <laughs> Plug. Well, look, Kevin, thank you very much indeed for that tour of the horizon. I'm sure you'll be watching uh, Boris address the nation at eight o'clock, but most of my audience would prefer to be addressed by me. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Let me do my first question uh, of the evening. On this day in 1901, crikey, we're going back, Guglielmo Marconi, if I said that right, sent the first transatlantic radio signal from Cornwall to Newfoundland in Canada. What was the message? A, hello, B, S, that's not B, S, that's B, S, C, over. Answer after the break. Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. From the makers of Track and Trace comes the Boris Johnson sat-nav. Right, uh, next right. Uh, no, left, uh, I, I mean left. Uh, oh, yes, uh, this, no, this left. Oh, cracky, you've missed it, bugger. Um, no bloody Tories. Or, or have you? Ah, uh, uh, turn around. Or in fact, don't turn around. Carry on. Yes. Ah! 
You have arrived at your destination. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. talk shows join our faculty of legends contributors and callers everyone is welcome so marconi sent the first transatlantic radio signal on this day in 1901 from cornwall to newfoundland in canada what was the message well the message was the letter s it was in morse code three short beeps dots beep 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 why i don't know now look, the poll is going great guns. Are these the last days of Boris Johnson, PM? On Twitter, uh, the answer is A, yes, 61%, B, no, 39%. On YouTube, it's uh, higher, yes, 68%, no, 32%. And on Telegram, yes, 72%, no, 28%. You can vote for another hour or so on that. It's not really about whether you want this to be the last days, or whether you prefer somebody else to him. It's really about uh, whether or not you think these are, objectively speaking, the last uh, days. And uh, let me read one or two social media Points, Graham says, doesn't matter what leader or what party at the moment, Labour and Tory, both singing the same corporate song. And Nick says, but if and when he's replaced, either by a new prime minister or even by a new party, well, that can't happen. The next prime minister will be a conservative. Uh, they will still have the same civil servants, the same advisors, etc. And uh, Nyla says, yes. We're having a huge going away party protest for him on Saturday, December the 18th outside Downing Street and Parliament Square at 12 noon. Please spread the word and feel free to join us. We know Boris loves party, so <laughs> what a nice way for us to show him the door. Smiling face with open mouth and tightly closed eyes. That's the tweet of the night so far. Uh, now, uh, amongst many huge stories uh, that have been uh, rolling out this week. The trial of Ghislaine Maxwell should have been right up there, but I don't know about you. I get the feeling the mainstream media are doing their best to pretend uh, that it isn't happening. Uh, a, 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 a scion of the, um, the commercial capitalist aristocracy is on trial in a New York courtroom charged with really quite heinous, sordid, dirty offences that could send her to prison for 80 years. Moreover, some of the household names of the last 30 years, some of the richest and most powerful people in the world are being name-checked hourly in the courtroom. I was following a number of outlets on Twitter to get uh, an hour by hour play by play until Twitter closed them down. But they can't close us down and they'll never close down my next guest, Kirby Summers, who has done so much uh, to keep this story in the public eye and whose book uh, books now on Ghislaine Maxwell are a great read and uh, rapidly becoming bestsellers. Uh, and she joins us again. Kirby, thank you for doing so. Uh, just uh, summarise the kind of week that Ghislaine Maxwell has had, if you would. Hi, George. Thanks Hi. for having me again. Welcome. Well, it's been um, a very interesting two weeks. Mainstream media, the very few who are reporting, are busy on Twitter, making up lies, Oh, the, 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 there's a lot of coverage. And there was a photograph taken by a New York Times reporter for the New York Times of three people in, in front of the courtroom, three reporters. They said, look at the crowd. Well, the crowd of three. So this is the biggest 
um, criminal case of our lifetime, in my opinion. I'm going to remind everyone of what she is charged of, but it is the least covered. I think the only people that are covering it are people like yourself, me, and some random people on Twitter. Would you agree? Yes, and it's bizarre. The Rittenhouse uh, uh, trial was wall-to-wall, live courtroom footage, uh, and that's been true of so many cases uh, that uh, that had less of an international impact than this case. Agree. What happened is that on November 2nd, the, the COVID restriction for the courts was uh, changed. But it was uh, then given over to the judges to make the determination whether or not they would do what they had done from the time that she appeared on July the 14th of 2020 for the first bail hearing. I called in, many people called in throughout the course of this trial. It's still a federal trial. Federal trials are not televised, but you can call in, especially during COVID. But isn't that interesting that on November 2nd, you know, just very soon before the trial of Glenn Maxwell is scheduled to begin, which was November 29th, the law changed, giving again the judge the ability to deny or accept. And Judge Nathan uh, decided there's going to be no call in. And I don't know if I need to remind your audience, but uh, our current president, Joe Biden, did give Judge Nathan a nomination for the second court, you know, the circuit of a a second circuit court uh, just one week before the trial began. That's like a a promotion, in other words. Yes, it's actually the, the, the one level beneath the highest court. Um, so that happened, uh, but so the charges are, to remind everyone, yeah. uh, she is charged with one count of enticing a minor to travel to engage in illegal sex acts. That carries a, mi- a maximum sentence of five years. There's one count of conspiracy to entice a minor to travel to engage in illegal sex acts, and that's another five years. There's one count of transporting a minor with the intent to engage in criminal sexual activity, that's 10 years. There's one count of conspiracy to transport a minor with the intent to engage in criminal sexual activity, and that carries a sentence of five years. So if she is convicted, you're looking at Glenn, you know, 40 to plus years in prison. However, this is just the first trial. I don't know if many people are aware, but there are two uh, counts of perjury, which were part of this in- initial trial, but which they requested, Glenn Maxwell's attorneys requested, they be put into a second trial. So after this trial is over, win or lose, Glenn Maxwell is still in jail because the second trial has to begin for the perjury. And what will the big names and big allegations that or big evidence, if you like, that emerged in the last week, Kirby? Well, I'll tell you, um, what was interesting is that Juan Alessi, who was Jeffrey Epstein's, uh, you can call him his house man, his, his butler, his housekeeper, mentioned big names, uh, the pilot's who have been with Jeffrey Epstein for since the 1990s. One was with him commencing 1991. Another was with him commencing 1997. Until, you know, the the very end, uh, they named big names, uh, you know, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Prince Andrew, you name it. I mean, they named many, many prominent people. However, you know, the pilots... Were, were made comments that I personally do not believe. They said they, when they were questioned as to whether or not they saw anything inappropriate on Jeffrey Epstein's planes, and they they both said they saw nothing. They saw nothing. They heard nothing. They saw nothing. But 
the way they described it, that they saw nothing, is that if if the bathroom is in the rear of the airplane, so that they would have to go to the rear of the airplane. Um, however, from the victims, from the court testimonies, from even myself knowing some of the victims, uh, the word is that they were abused in every place, not just on Jeffrey Epstein's island, not just in his homes, but in his vehicles and definitely on the plane. I mean, Jeffrey Epstein went so far as to put padded carpeting on the floor for orgies on the airplane. Wow. So for those two, yeah, so the two pilots to say that, that was so disingenuous. I thought, okay, perjury, perjury. <laughs> But will will they be held to account? I don't think so. Um, the whole thing has just been um, uh, it's it's heart wrenching to see the four women who are now they were one was four, two of them were fourteen, they're forty forty one years old now, waiting a very long time for justice. So this was the other one was um, seventeen. And this is interesting. The one that was 17, Ghislaine Maxwell met her initially in Paris with one of her friends, one of Ghislaine Maxwell's friends who went to school with her at Oxford University. So, so that he is a much older man. And to me, I found that really interesting. You've, I don't know if, I think you've read Ghislaine Maxwell, an unauthorized biography. Sure, of course. Yeah, and all of the interesting people that I dug out from getting scrubbed from the internet forever. Um, so that it's it, it was interesting to me that someone that Glenn Maxwell met in Oxford was dating a 17-year-old girl, right? And then, you know, it introduces her to Glenn Maxwell. They, they go on to meet up with her in London. Glenn Maxwell... It, because this girl, she's 17, she's starting to go to school and Galen uh, befriends her, invites her for tea. So she treats her with a little bit more class, let's say, than the other girls that she would just sort of, you know, jump in and sort of take advantage of. So she, she uh, made, well, what was clear was that she really used her charm and 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 her the illusion that she was their friend you know interested in their lives for all of them she made them promises that she would help their careers that Jeffrey Epstein could help them achieve whatever they wanted that they needed to help and and um but it was heartbreaking because her defense attorneys are animals animals the way they spoke to these girls and these the two points that the attorneys are attacking them on is their ability to remember so they're claiming you, you're misremembering that's not what you said you know in such and such a year and then they pull up documents and instead of making it easy they they confuse them there's like Oh, line this, you know, sort of like a very legalese conversation with a victim. They're just normal people. They're not lawyers to know it's this line and this pair, you know, very, very unusual behavior. Uh, so they're attacking them on that front and they're attacking them. And by the way, before I say this, I want to say that this is a federal case, or at least it should be right. But so there's no money. The victims are not testifying to get money at the end of this trial. This is just to put Galen behind bars and make her pay for her crimes, which are severe. Um, but the four victims were completely slut shamed. I'm going to use that term for having taken a settlement from the Ep Epstein's Victims Compensation Fund which they were almost forced into. So to get into the compensation fund, some of these victims had lawsuits against Ghislaine Maxwell. Why, why, why was that admissible, given that uh, these uh, victims 
having taken the money from the compensation fund, had nothing further to gain from giving evidence in a criminal trial where, as you say, no financial reward is the result, even if you are entirely vindicated. Yes, what they're trying to do and from, from my perspective is this is a New York jury. So I have my spies in the courtroom because I figured, you know, this is still Robert Maxwell's daughter. I might as well have my spies. I don't want to go to the courtroom every day. So I have my spies. And um, it's my understanding that the jury uh, is very New York-y. And so th what that means is that in New York City, the only people that really end up going to jury duty are hardworking people or retired people of, of different, different ethnicities. And so I think their strategy has been to say, oh, she got $1.5 million. That's not, in, you know, that's not insignificant. So that to say big numbers like that in front of a jury that's going to decide the fate of Galen Maxwell, in my opinion, I think that it's to make them look at the victims not in a sympathetic way, but sort of as they're only, you know, they only decided to say bad things about Ghislaine Maxwell because they wanted that money. But that's not true, because what happened was in order to get that money, they had to then withdraw their lawsuit against Ghislaine, which would have produced what we really want to see. It would have produced discovery. It would have produced what Virginia Dufresne's lawsuit produced, which is most of the information that we have access to. That's why we know about Prince Andrew. That's why we have that photograph of Prince Andrew and Virginia and Galen. So all of that discovery is out the window because they were told by the administrator of the fund well, you can take this money. It's a sure thing. And by the way, they would have gotten more if they won, like Virginia, you know, she, Galen settled. Uh, so they were misled, frankly, into accepting money that really they didn't really need to take. Um, but they were told, oh, the jury, you know, it'll go on forever, blah, blah. The other thing I want to bring to mind is She's still being allowed to do things in court that no one else that I have ever seen in a, in, a, in a courtroom do. So, for example, during the breaks, she sends notes back and forth to her sister, Isabel, to her brother, Kevin. Kevin and Isabel send notes to her. Um, uh, I mean, her brother, Kevin, will lean forward in his seat, remove his glasses, look intently, you know, sort of like almost, you can tell when someone is sending you bad energy and sitting in the courtroom and you're a, you know, you're a traumatized victim, re reliving the worst years of your life. And you have this older man, because now what, he's almost 70, I think. Well, they are uh, Maxwell's. Uh, the apples didn't fall all that no. far from the tree. Kirby, thank you for that update. We'll speak to you again, I'm sure, uh, later in the proceedings. It's uh, my duty now to take the, the news. Uh, but let me just tell you uh, that after this, we're talking to Richard Medhurst on Julian Assange on the travesty of the miscarriage of justice that took place in a London courtroom just a few days ago. Uh, but first, it's the news with Jamie Lowe.
Radio Sputnik News. The UK's coronavirus alert level has been raised from three to four due to the spread of Omicron, the UK's chief medical officers have said. The last time that the UK was at level four was in May. Prime Minister Boris Johnson is due to make a televised statement on COVID any moment now. He's expected to provide an update on the booster programme, but it's not uh, expected that any new rules will be announced. On Sunday evening, the chief medical officers for England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland said they were recommending the alert level is raised from three to four, signifying that COVID is spreading fast. Risks are measured by a five-tier level. Colour-coded system level four means a high or rising level of transmission. That system is separate and independent from any government decisions on easing or tightening rules. In their statement, the chief medical officers said early evidence shows that the Omicron variant is spreading much faster than Delta and that vaccine protection against symptomatic disease from Omicron is reduced. The first people in the UK have now been admitted to hospital with Omicron infections. The new variant of the coronavirus now accounts for a third of cases in London, the Education Secretary Nadeem Zahawi said. He added that two doses of a vaccine were not enough and he encouraged people to get a booster jab. As of yesterday, there have been 1,898 confirmed cases of the variant in the UK, but the true number is likely to be far higher. Scientists from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine have warned that the UK will face a substantial wave of Omicron infections with further restrictions beyond the Plan B measures announced last week. These include recommending people work from home if they can, expanding mask wearing rules and introducing COVID passes for entry to some venues with Parliament to vote on the changes on Tuesday. Dr Susan Hopkins, Chief Medical Advisor for the UK Health Security Agency, said that she expected to see an increase in the number of people in hospital with Omicron infections. She said there had not been a report of a death from the variant in the UK yet, although she pointed out that it had only been identified two weeks ago. She added that it was inevitable that there was going to be a big wave of infections, but what was not clear was the impact it would have on hospitals. New COVID restrictions could be introduced in Scotland next week, the Deputy First Minister has warned. John Swinney said the Scottish Government is, quote, wrestling with the challenge of the surge of the Omicron variant. New self-isolation rules have come into force as Scotland recorded 4,087 new COVID cases on Saturday. All household contacts of someone with the virus should now isolate for 10 days regardless of vaccination status. Swinney said that the Scottish Government would spend the weekend deciding what to do next. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has accused Boris Johnson of breaking the law after a picture appeared of the Prime Minister in a Christmas quiz sitting between two colleagues in number 10 last year. At the time, indoor household mixing was banned in London. The Sunday Mirror newspaper published the picture of Johnson at the event, which it said was on December the 15th. Downing Street said he, quote, briefly took part virtually to thank staff for their work during the pandemic. Starmer said the event had created fury and that trust in the Prime Minister was at an all-time low. He said, quote, he is the worst possible leader at the worst possible time. It comes after the government launched an investigation into three allegations of gatherings last Christmas, including two in Downing Street, despite COVID rules banning them. In the photo, Johnson is sitting in the number 10 library between a colleague wearing a tinsel scarf and another apparently in a Santa hat. The G7 group of rich countries has warned Russia of a, quote, massive consequences if it invades Ukraine. UK Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, speaking after a summit in Liverpool, said that the group wanted Russia to stop its aggression towards Ukraine. However, President Putin told President Biden during their video call last week that Russian troops did not pose a threat to anyone, Russian media reports. Putin added that he had no particular grounds for optimism after speaking to Biden, but would like to meet him in person, local media quoted a Kremlin spokesperson as saying. Ukrainian authorities have claimed Moscow could be planning a military offensive at the end of January. A desperate search is underway for survivors in parts of six U.S. states devastated by powerful tornadoes that have left at least 83 people dead. 
Dozens more people are missing and entire towns were destroyed by about 30 tornadoes on Friday. President Biden has declared a disaster in Kentucky, the worst affected state. More than 70 people have died in the state, including dozens in a candle factory, and the death toll is expected to rise above 100. 40 people have been rescued from the collapsed candle factory in Mayfield, but 60 remain missing. And Kentucky Governor Andy Beshear, who has visited the scene, said it was unlikely there were more survivors. A bishop in Spain has had his clerical powers removed following his marriage to an author of erotica with alleged satanic undertones. The Diocese of Solsona, where Xavier Novel Goma has been serving as a bishop, issued a statement on Saturday that said Novel is now forbidden from administering the sacraments and engaging in any teaching, although he can still maintain his status as a bishop. According to the statement, Novel Bishop Emeritus of Sultana entered into a civil marriage with Silvia Caballol on November the 22nd, 2021. According to reports, Novel has supported gay conversion therapy and has also carried out exorcism. Caballol, who is 38, began her career as a novelist in 2015, according to a profile on the website of her publisher. She is trained in clinical psychology as well as sexology and yoga, the profile says. Formula One racing driver Max Verstappen has won his first world championship, overtaking Lewis Hamilton on the last lap and depriving the British driver of his eighth title. The race was restarted with one lap to go with Verstappen on fresh tyres and Hamilton on old ones and the Dutchman swept past Hamilton to win the race and the world title. At the end of the race, while Verstappen screamed with delight and his Red Bull team celebrated, Hamilton sat in his Mercedes for several minutes, disbelieving at the way events had turned against him in the final minutes. And finally, a photo belonging to a Kentucky family was found nearly 130 miles away in Indiana after the series of tornadoes which tore through several US states. On Saturday morning, a woman in Indiana noticed an old photo stuck to the window of her car. Katie Poston tweeted, quote, walked out to my car in New Albany and found this picture stuck to the window, undoubtedly from a home that was struck by the tornado that ripped through Kentucky last night. She added, hoping to find its owners, it looks like it reads Gertie Swatzel and JD Swatzel 1942. Please retweet. A member of the Swatzel family living in Dawson Springs, Kentucky, contacted Poston the same day, who then tweeted that she was making plans to return the photo. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. Are these the last days of Boris Johnson's premiership? He's hanging on in there. Uh, 59% say yes, 41% say no. Although it's worse for him on YouTube and on Telegram. Only 31% say no on my YouTube channel and only 27% say no on my telegram. Get voting now on one of these three. Now, a reminder of the numbers, there's extra time for callers because of the gravity of the situation that faces us, 0808 if you're in the United Kingdom. It's completely free, 0808 And if you're in the United States or Canada, it's plus one, 844 Double three, double four, and it's toll free there also. Plus one, eight four four nine four four double three, double four. You can email the show on air at moats.tv, or you can tweet me as hundreds of people are doing. But I haven't been able to make much of a dent on that. I will try, but I want to move on to the grave situation uh, facing Julian Assange, whose extradition to the United States, where he faces a kangaroo court in uh, Virginia, home of the CIA, and the uh, almost certainty of a lifetime sentence, the maximum, up to 175 years. But Julian, at this stage, looks as if he'd be lucky to last 175 days. Uh, stricken uh, with a mini-stroke 
already suffering psychological and other physical ailments and being kept locked up in a maximum security jail in Belmarsh, even though he's been convicted of precisely nothing. Now, Richard Medhurst is a journalist and commentator of note, a rising star, man with a big following himself, and deservedly so, is our first guest on that this evening. Richard, welcome again to the mother of all talk shows. Um, your thoughts, Harry. first of all, uh, on the melancholy news uh, that the court found for uh, the United States government. Uh, were you surprised at that? And what was the basis of their finding? Thanks for having me, George. Uh, I was, you know, I was uh, connected to the court. I was attending remotely and the whole thing lasted about 10 minutes. Um, you know, uh, uh, Lord, Lord Chief Justice uh, Timothy Holroyd read the whole thing out in a few seconds uh, so casually as if it was nothing. And I, I was left stunned, honestly. Uh, the fact that the high court has decided to overturn uh, Barretto's decision and let this extradition go ahead is, is really uh, astonishing. Uh, if you read the, the ruling that has been handed down, they refer to previous cases where the United States handed out diplomatic assurances, these same promises which they say are, are indestructible and bulletproof. Well, I can tell you they're not. Uh, one of the cases they refer to is David Mendoza. Assange's lawyers brought up David Mendoza's case and they said he was also given assurances. The United States broke these assurances uh, when they extradited him from Spain to the US in 2009. And the high court justices apparently, as they say in the ruling, apparently they looked at Mendoza's case and found nothing wrong with it. Well, I'm very sorry, but these classified documents that I published have plenty, plenty wrong. Uh, with the assurances that Mendoza was given. He was also told that he can serve the uh, sentence given in his home country, just like they're telling Assange. He can go back to Australia and serve a sentence there. They said the same thing to Mendoza. He can go to Spain and serve a sentence there. Well, guess what? That never happened because the United States kept him there for seven years. They denied his application three times, as the documents show. And they only let Mendoza go back after he sued Spain at the Spanish Supreme Court and after he sued the Department of Justice. And in Mendoza's case, he, he wasn't just given some, some vague assurance, which is also the case with Assange. Uh, he was given a contract, a very specific contract that was spy, signed by the US, by Spain, and by himself. Assange doesn't even have that. He only has a vague assurance that, that if you actually read it, it doesn't really say that they won't put him in oppressive prison conditions, these special administrative measures. It says that they won't put him there unless he does something to merit the imposition of a Sam, which could be anything. You know, he could pass on some innocent comment or, or have an innocent conversation with his lawyers or with his fiance. And just like that, they will send him to Sam's. And they have another variety, they have a whole variety of other hell holes they can put Assange in. You know, the, these uh, communication management units, special housing units, all sorts of, pr of, uh, of, of prisons designed to isolate people and which could trigger a suicide attempt. And so I'm, I'm absolutely stunned that the High Court justices looked at Mendoza's case and found nothing wrong and that they actually believe these assurances from the United States. I'm convinced that they have not seen these documents because if they had seen them and they came to this judgment, I mean, they, they're just terribly, terribly mistaken. And you've published these documents where, Richard? I published them about two weeks ago on, on my Substack. Uh, so it's a very long article. It's about 7,000, uh, 8,000 words. And uh, these are documents from the U.S. Department of Justice, from the U.S. Embassy in Madrid, from the Spanish courts. And you can see very clearly the assurances that, were, that came from the U.S. Embassy, just like they're giving assurances to Assange, right? Diplomatic assurances. In the high court, the lead prosecutor, James Lewis, who's prosecuting Assange, he said that diplomatic assurances are solemn undertakings. <laughs> he said they're not dished out like Smarties. He's right. They're not dished out like Smarties. So when they're, when they're given, we should analyze them. And I'm very sorry, but Mendoza, his assurance was absolutely vague and ambiguous. Uh, with Assange, equally vague and ambiguous. And so if you, even if you just read them, you just take these things at face value. You just cannot trust them. Well, they're, and, not, they're not worth the paper in some cases that they're not written on. Uh, right. For example, the, uh, the Australia offer. 
requires the Australian government to ask for Julian Assange to be sent into their prison system. If they don't ask, and Australia is now a vassal state of the United States, as it was formerly a vassal state of ours, uh, there are many ways to persuade Australia not to ask for Julian Assange, in which case he serves the time in a US uh, uh, maximum security prison. It doesn't have to be the one they've given a diplomatic assurance that it won't be. It can be any number of equally atrocious maximum security uh, prisons. So in this case, it's not worth the uh, paper that it is written on. Vague, uh, as you say, in the extreme. Now, the, the ruling, if I've read it correctly, Richard, did have some saving graces for those of us who wish to see uh, this world historic figure free to join his family again. Uh, it accepted uh, the medical situation of Julian Assange. It did not accept the US contention that Julian was some kind of malingerer. It accepted Judge Barrister's uh, analysis that he would be a very severe risk of committing suicide if sent to the United States. The whole thing, it seemed to me, if I've read it correctly, turned on the assurances, which means the only thing we have to knock down now at the higher court is the assurances. Am I clasping at straws? George, you are 120% correct. Uh, the, the high court ruling did find that, that Assange is indeed in a precarious mental state and then the extradition would be oppressive. Uh, the, the district judge court, uh, you know, the district judge, Vanessa Bretzer, she didn't make a mistake. She applied Section 91 of the Extradition Act correctly, and she ruled the extradition to be oppressive because it is oppressive. He, he, Assange would kill himself if extradited. And, uh, you know, I, I, again, I think it's, it's, it's tragic that the whole case is hinging on his health and assurances. You know, it, it's an indictment that criminalizes journalism. We should never forget that. But you are correct. And the whole thing, um, the whole ruling is all about these assurances. This is why Mendoza's case is more important than ever before, because uh, Assange's lawyers mentioned it. The judges say they looked at it and found nothing wrong, which, I mean, I'm absolutely stunned. I'm absolutely stunned. Uh, I cannot believe for one second that they actually looked at the case seriously, because these documents that I published were never seen in court. I've covered Assange's entire extradition uh, case, and these documents were never brought up. Uh, maybe at best they've seen the vague diplomatic assurance that was sent in January 2009, but everything else they haven't seen. And uh, as I said, Mendoza was given a second diplomatic assurance, a contract, which is even more explicit. Um, and now, uh, of course, uh, when it comes to Assange being extradited, uh, we have to remember that, as you just uh, correctly uh, mentioned, they have a whole a slew of other prisons they could put him in that are not ADX Florence, that are not special administrative measures, which could still lead to suicide because... Uh, what Barretts have found in her ruling is that it's the isolation, uh, the, the solitude, being cut off from his family, which would trigger a suicide attempt. And the United States can achieve this in, uh, in a, a whole variety of ways. It doesn't have to put him specifically in ADX Florence or, uh, as we said, in, in special administrative measures. It has many, 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 many other varieties of prisons. And, uh, you know, you are 100 percent correct, George, when you say that all that needs to be knocked down now are the assurances. Uh, this is where we're at. This is the battle that needs to be fought. And uh, the United States has a history of breaking its assurances, whether it's the Iran nuclear deal or prison transfers. It, it has a history of doing this. It, it gains foreign jurisdictions. It tricks them into sending people over to the U.S. And once they're in the U.S., you can't do anything. Exactly. Uh, let me bowl a couple of points at you, Richard. Forgive me, I didn't get the chance to, uh, to advise you of that in, uh, in advance. Uh, forgive me if you're not able to deal with it. Um, especially as it's a very British thing. The judge is, not was, is a close friend of little Alan Duncan, the runt that used to uh, uh, scurry around the British Foreign Office and who played a seminal role in the handover uh, of Julian Assange from the Ecuadorian embassy who called Assange in Parliament 
a worm, which the Speaker didn't seem to find to be unparliamentary language. Uh, he still meets with Alan Duncan. Alan Duncan wrote in his book all about his friendship with the learned judge. And it turns out that the learned judge and the runt, Alan Duncan, lunched in advance uh, of this hearing. Of course, uh, Solomon binding uh, promises were made that the case never came up. The biggest case in British judicial history for decades never came up over the lunch. I am taking a risk making this point, but I have no faith uh, that the man who is best buddies since university with a minister who played such a role in getting their hands on uh, Julian Assange should not have recused himself from the whole thing in the first place. Now, I, George, I mean, uh, who could forget Sir Alan Duncan? Uh, you know, when Assange was in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, there was all sorts of talk about storming the embassy. They wanted to break the Vienna Convention. They wanted to violate all sorts of uh, international norms and, and, and storm it. I mean, this is, this is unheard of. And the, the connection that you just brought up, I mean, does it surprise any of us? No, not really. Uh, if, if you look at the other judges that are involved in, in this case, uh, you know, uh, Lady Arbuthnot. Arbuthnot Bresser, had conflicts of interest also. There you go. Yeah, the Henry Jackson Society. There's all sorts of red flags popping up everywhere. And this is, the, this is exactly the issue. This, the whole system is inherently, uh, I don't know what you were to use, corrupt. It's, it's incorrigible. I, I don't know. But it, there's something wrong with it. There's something inherently wrong with the system that all the people who are in positions of power uh, are criminalizing journalism, are, are saying that it's OK to ship people off to the United States, which has the biggest prison population on Earth, which has a prison industry, which makes money off of incarcerating people. Uh, uh, they have uh, you know, inhumane torture camps like Guantanamo Bay. I mean, it's, the, the list is endless. 25 percent of all the prisoners in the world are in the United States, which has 3 percent of the world's population. It's, it's, it's incredible. The, I mean, this is astronomical figures. And uh, I bet you one thing, uh, uh, George, if you look at how many people are being extradited from the US to other countries, you're not gonna find anything. Well, that was my next good. question, Rich. Uh, <laughs> that was exactly my next question. We have a situation here where a young boy, poor Harry Dunn, was mowed down by a CIA officer operating covertly from a British military base who fled the coup back to the United States with the connivance of the runt Alan Duncan's foreign office uh, and who the United States refuses to send back to face the music in a British court. What kind of extradition system is this? where uh, not just any American, but an American official claiming diplomatic immunity to which she was not entitled can kill a young boy in Britain and the US will not send her back here for a trial for careless driving, reckless driving, driving uh, dangerously, not to spend 175 years in a British prison, uh, probably not even to go to prison at all. Uh, what kind of one-sided extradition system is this? It's absolutely disgusting, uh, George. You know, they, they put this whole extradition treaty into place in 2003 under the premise that, you know, it's a mutual agreement, as a treaty should be. But it's completely one-sided. It's absolutely a one-way street. And, uh, you know, they, they just want to have a um, carte blanche. They just want to do whatever they like and, 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 and pinch people from, from our country from the UK, take them to the US, but they'll never send anyone from the US to the UK. I believe that the CIA agent you mentioned, her name is Anne Sekoulis, and as you mentioned, she, she was driving on the wrong side of the road and she kills Harry Dunn. Uh, she, she, you know, a head-on collision with his motorcycle, he's dead, and then Trump, Trump refuses to extradite uh, her back to the UK. And, and by the way, before she even left, 
as you said, the foreign office knew and they let her go. Yeah, they yeah. let her leave. And, and then Trump tries to buy off Harry Dunn's parents. He tries to buy them off after this, this uh, uh, CIA agent just recklessly killed their boy. And it's just absolutely disgusting. It really shows you how one-sided it is. Why, you know, at the same time, they're trying to take Assange uh, uh, for, for publishing documents which expose crimes against humanity. He, it, it, it's, a, it's not just a victimless crime. It's not a crime at all. It's a public service. It's a public Yeah, yeah, good. sure. He should have the Nobel Prize for it. Lastly, and I'm grateful for yeah. your time, Richard, uh, the, um, you mentioned 2003. I was there. I, I lobbied. Uh, the then Home Secretary, David Blunkett, now Lord Blunkett, uh, and uh, pointed out to him that uh, any Nelson Mandela figure in the future could be extradited, not just to the United States, but anywhere, uh, if this kind of uh, extradition treaty, one-sided as it is, were to go through. And he assured me, I can still see his lips moving, that on the face of the bill, on the first page, it specifically excluded extradition of political, uh, people charged with political offenses. And I tell you something, I've never said this before because it was, the conversation was on lobby terms, but we have now moved past that, I'm afraid. David Blunkett said to me that that was there because the Americans would never agree to extraditing, for example, Irish Republican fugitives in the United States to face trial in Britain on what would be described as political charges. Not terrorist charges, but political charges. So he conceded to me that people charged with a political offense under this treaty, cannot be extradited. And yet Julian now faces charges that could not be more political, revelations about, about crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, malfeasance in the Democratic Party, DNC, and so on. I just don't know how to make any sense of that. Has Britain entirely lost its sense of itself as an independent and sovereign country? Are we just a vassal now, like Australia once was to us? I mean, I don't know what to, to say anymore that I haven't already said. I mean, I was, I was you, know, you know, when the extradition hearing uh, uh, concluded last year in October, I was standing outside the Old Bailey and, 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 and I said, you know, this is a UK court. It's, it's in the middle of London, but the United States is holding the gavel. They are running the show from top to bottom. And it's what, what you've just told me. I, re, I remember David Blunkett. Uh, and uh, what you've just told me is, is incredible. It, the extradition treaty should bar political uh, extraditions. Uh, it, it should forbid these things. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, I think in the British implementation of it, in the Extradition Act, that that is that clause is not present. Although I could be wrong, but there, you know, I, it, it sounds so unbelievable. That's why I'm questioning myself if if that if it's actually true. But uh, wh whether it's actually there or not is 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 really in practice making no difference because, as you've just correctly pointed out, the indictment against Julian Assange is wholly, uh, unequivocally political. And uh, you know, if you're going to jail Assange, you you have to go after the New York Times. You have to go after everyone who profited, who, who you know, people who made careers off of the documents that he provided them with. The Guardian, Le Monde, Presse, all of these huge outlets published the same documents, and I don't see anyone going after them. No. I'm not saying they should, but you see a double standard here, a very clear double standard. He, he exposed their dirty laundry, and that's why they're going after him. It's really that simple. Uh, and uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's just disgusting. What, what more can I say? Uh, and anyone who looks at Assange's case and cannot understand that this is political is, uh, is you know, being ignorant um, uh, on, on purpose. I, I just, you know, I can't fathom people who don't understand this. Uh, the man is facing 175 years for publishing documents. Who on earth could tolerate this? Well, how do you call that justice? Well, the New York Times, I think it was today, it may have been yesterday or the day before, had a whole page. The top half of the page was the awarding of the Nobel Prize to three reporters 
considered to have uh, done their duty uh, to uh, report the truth uh, of alleged malfeasance in various countries, the Philippines, Russia, and uh, other uh, predictable places. Uh, and on the bottom half of the same page of the New York Times, it covered the decision uh, to extradite Julian Assange. You couldn't make that up, Richard. Yeah, well, I can tell you one thing, George. Uh, you know, when, when we're in court covering the Assange thing, we're about 10 people, and there's no one from mainstream media. There was someone from Sky News who rolled up one day. He didn't even know the judge's name. He had to look at his cue card to find the judge's name. So, you know, they, they're ripping off of our reporting and then twisting it and skewing it to smear him and act like it's, it's not political and he's a, a, a criminal, he's a hacker. Everything to take away from his, uh, his achievements because they're jealous. They hate that he has actually done what they all pretend to do, which is hold governments accountable, which is to, to advocate transparency and really publish documents that make a difference, that, that uh, hold those who commit war crimes accountable. They, they've never done these things. And that's why they hate Assange. And they always try to paint him as a criminal and, and take away, uh, to chip away at his, his accomplishments and achievements. That's, that's all it is. So it's not over until it's over. What happens next, Richard? So uh, Stella Morris, who is Assange's partner, but she's also on the legal team, she said that they'll be appealing this. Uh, Assange's lawyers will be appealing this decision to the Supreme Court. They have 14 days to do that, and uh, that, that's what they plan to do next. Uh, honestly, these documents, if the judges haven't seen them, they have to see them, because what they wrote in their ruling is uh, it's just wrong. It's just absolutely wrong. Uh, I have the assurance here from the U.S. Embassy in Madrid to Mendoza I think this is the only thing that they have seen. They haven't seen the other assurances that he was given, and the United States broke, unequivocally broke. So the conclusion they came to is absolutely wrong. I'm sorry. The United States has a past of breaking assurances. This is a fact. It's not my opinion. The documents are crystal clear, and the judges need to correct this. The higher court needs to correct this. Richard, you're a bright star. Thanks for shining light on this story for us this evening. Richard Medhurst journalist and commentator. If you're not yet following him, please, please do. He's really one of the best in the business. Uh, can I do a, a question now? I know I'm late. In this week, in 1917, the 18th Amendment to the US Constitution was passed. What did it ban? A, slavery, B, homosexuality, C, alcohol. Answer after the break. Radio Sputnik. Preferred the old format where George was actually writing his own monologue to start off the show instead of the scripted RT half stand up comedy routine rubbish. Where is the passion gone, George? <laughs> I, I don't know where to start with that. I really don't, Budrick. First of all, I have never, ever written a single word that I have ever said. I don't write scripts. I don't have a script. RT doesn't write a stand-up comedy routine script for me. RT doesn't write anything for me or give me any advice as to what I should say in any circumstances. I am the freest commentator in the entire media world. I have worked for RT for more than a decade without a single person ever saying to me that they would like me to say this or that they would not like me to say that. You Egypt. <laughs> There you go. There is no auto cue. There is no script. Far less one that's written by RT. What's wrong with you, man? As a matter of fact, the most criticism I get in comments on Facebook, on YouTube, is that I'm doing too much shouting. And you're now demanding more passion. I'll give you passion. Why don't you call me? 0808196552. Call me right now and I will passionately, verbally, box your ears for you. <laughs>
tough questions are the most powerful weapon we have. As long as you have questions, we'll keep asking. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Well, the answer, of course, is that in this week in 1917, the US Constitution was amended to ban alcohol. Until they discovered the Americans were even worse without drink than they are with it. Sorry to all my American friends. Uh, are these the last days of Boris Johnson, PM? Yes, 59%, no, 41%. Uh, 2,500 people have voted. You can still vote uh, until nine o'clock, I think, on that. Have your say. Now, I've been addressing not just the nation, but many nations uh, since uh, seven o'clock. But at eight o'clock, Boris Johnson addressed this nation. Let's find out what he said and whether anyone actually believed it. My RT colleague and friend Shadia Edwards Dashti was listening for us on the mother of all talk shows and she joins me. Now, Shadia, thank you for doing this. We didn't expect to uh, work you on a, on a Sunday night, but uh, Boris uh, surprised us all uh, with this impromptu address to the nation. Uh, what did he say? Oh, what did he say? What did he not say? Same old slogan, same old story, really, is what we heard from Boris Johnson just a few minutes ago. Same key buzzwords, you know, things like it's an emergency situation. We are in a critical, urgent time. There's a tidal wave of Omicron coming. But the real tidal wave is how bad is British politics now? Because nobody can believe a word that Boris Johnson says anymore. Yes, we all know that we're in a really dire situation when it comes to the pandemic. Pandemic. We've all been living in it for the last two years. So we know this loud and clear. But everything that he was saying was nothing really new. He was saying how bad it is and get boosted now. That was his uh, main slogan, the main takeaway today. But while uh, Boris Johnson was talking, I do think it's important to say this, at the very same time, trending on Twitter was nation switch off. That was basically people on Twitter saying, switch off the TV, don't listen to Boris Johnson, because quite frankly, the public just don't want to hear from him anymore. I think that's, uh, unfortunately, perhaps, uh, absolutely true. Uh, there's, there's two questions immediately arise. Let me deal with the most banal. Uh, get boosted now. I've been trying to get boosted for some weeks, but I've not yet been able to. And I'm, as you know, over 50. Uh, uh, so uh, he's promised, I'm told, that everyone will be offered a booster, every adult, every adult, not just people over 50 like me, by the end of the year, which is actually very soon. Uh, how credible a promise is that? So what we're hearing from Boris Johnson today is anybody over the age of 18 will be boosted by the end of January next ah, year. Now, ah. that is pretty much an impossible situation considering everything that we've seen over the last two years almost now. All of these uh, promises, these deadlines, you know, think back to the time of the track and trace situation. Think back to the time that everyone, one million people will be uh, vaccinated and one million people will be tested. All of these promises and under delivering. So you can say any adult will be uh, vaccinated, have their third uh, jab, their booster jab by this certain XYZ date, but really, can the government deliver on any of that? So when we hear this sort of thing from Boris Johnson, quite frankly, this amount of time into the pandemic, people are just thinking, what are you, why are you coming on my television on a Sunday evening to tell me this, when every single time you've come on my television, you haven't ever delivered what you said you were going to do? The second thing that arises is this, it's a bit more problematic. Did he address the fact uh, that the woman that discovered Omicron attests that it is less deadly, she says far less deadly, uh, than the Delta variant, which was uh, hitherto uh, dominant. And that she thinks that Britain has panicked entirely unnecessarily. I'll tell you my problem, Shadia. Words like tidal wave, 
uh, mm. or in Nicola Sturgeon's case, a tsunami. Uh, these are words that are deliberately used to panic people when many authorities attest that actually there's nothing to panic about. Of course, it would be better not to get the Omicron, but it turns out it might be better to get the Omicron than to get the Delta. Did he deal think, with that? No, he didn't speak about anything like that. And he always says, let's go to Chris Whitty, who will talk through the slides. Boris Johnson wants to do the rhetoric and the slogan, then he moves shifting responsibility elsewhere to talk about the real situation. We have many, many scientists saying it's not as deadly as so-and-so and X, Y, Z. Science aside, I'm not a scientist, I don't know the answer to that. But what my problem is, if you as the Prime Minister are going to say this is a tidal wave, a tsunami of a situation, then why on earth are you going to a Christmas party at the heights of this said tsunami? Why are you hosting pub quizzes? This isn't just one slip up or two. There are a handful now of allegations of Christmas parties or gatherings, or let's call it a business meeting, where Boris Johnson and his chums are breaking the rules that they set in stone. So, whether it's a tidal wave or not, I'm not sure. I have no idea about the absolute science. But what we're seeing is that the science behind it is sort of really being challenged on all corners of the globe. And so that's one thing, whether or not what they're saying is true. But the other issue is if it is true, and even if they think it's true, then why aren't they going with the rules themselves? Sure. I mean, even the new Plan B... Uh, we're supposed to work from home, but go up the West End uh, at the weekend and, and party. Uh, we're told by Boris Johnson's government, not in Scotland, uh, that the Christmas parties should go ahead. Well, if it's a tsunami, a tidal wave headed our way, uh, these decisions that they're making don't quite square with that. No. No, they really do not square with that at all. Quite frankly, I was actually expecting a larger announcement than it was this evening. I thought Boris Johnson was actually going to move towards more of a lockdown situation because we're hearing all of this fear-mongering, scare-mongering kind of slogans of tidal wave, tsunami, urgent, emergency, keep your loved ones safe, we've got to protect the NHS, you name it, we've heard it. So I was expecting a bit more. So things aren't really adding up at the same time and it's very difficult for the public to sort of get on board with Boris Johnson's bipolar personality in terms of his uh, political rhetoric. Because if we look back to last year, one minute was eat out to help out, go go to work, but don't get on the tube, get the public transport, but or go and get in your car rather than get the public transport, but we're putting congestion charge up. This is a really impossible situation for people to get their head around. And it's so difficult, not only for people to abide, but quite frankly, what you're probably going to see is people are just going to say, I I'm not doing it. I'm actually not doing it. Well, thank you for watching it, Shadia. So I didn't have to. Uh, it's very kind <laughs> of you, Shadia edwards Dashti, my colleague on RT. Uh, now, I've got another question to ask you. In 1939, the film Gone with the Wind premiered in Atlanta. Adjusted for inflation, is it the highest grossing film of all time? If not, what is? Is it A, yes, the highest grossing film of all time? B, Avatar. What's Avatar? C, Titanic. Answer after the break. Radio Sputnik. The mother of all talk shows was created because early lunacy detection can save lives. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, some IQs declined by 90%. Now, doctors are diagnosing later stage lunacy, which could have been detected sooner. Don't wait. Share the mother of all talk shows with a loved one and speak to George Galloway about common sense today. It takes all of us to overcome idiots. Call the teacher today and get an education.
tough questions are the most powerful weapon we have. As long as you have questions, we'll keep asking. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. The answer is yes. Gone with the Wind was not just the biggest grossing film of all time. In today's money, it grossed $3.8 billion. The other two are second and third. And I still don't know what Avatar, which is second, even is. Who's in it? Tell me more about Avatar, if you will. The poll is almost over, I think. 2,700 people have voted. And Boris Johnson still hanging on in there with between a third and uh, 40% or so uh, thinking that he's going to hang on. I bet he's had his friends voting on this one. Uh, let's take Simon in London on uh, Austin Allegra Stratton, the erstwhile press advisor, public relations advisor to the prime minister who had to resign in the week after some very embarrassing footage of hers somehow miraculously appeared on ITV News. Uh, Simon, welcome. How are you doing, George? You OK? Good. The better for hearing from you. What would you like to say? Uh, Scott, Scott, uh, just a quick uh, um, uh, thing I want to say. Basically, you, you've had Jesse Ventura on your show in the past, as you know. Yes. A very great man. A very He's great, a great friend talker, of mine, best, yes. One of the best talkers I've ever seen, of course, in the 1980s. I used to follow pro wrestling. But it's interesting what he once said. Um, in pro wrestling, there's something called kayfabe. I don't know whether you're familiar with that term. No. Kayfabe is effectively the line between fiction and reality. And in the past, wrestlers who were involved in the wrestling industry effectively were outcasts. If they had a broke kayfabe, if they broke that line between fiction and reality. And, of course, there's a very famous example of this in 1996, uh, whereby there was a curtain call incident whereby several wrestlers got together and um, showed that, they, that, that everything was fixed, basically. Now, this brings me to the uh, media incident last uh, this, this past week with uh, um, uh, Miss Strachan, Allegra Strachan, uh, with regards to this press rehearsal. And when it was revealed, they were all embarrassed. But Allegra Strachan didn't resign because she was embarrassed about the fact that they'd locked down and they'd ignored all the lockdown rules. No, they, she resigned purely because she'd effectively broken this line between fiction and reality. And the truth is, all journalists, all press pack journalists, were at the Christmas party, or most of them certainly were. Um, and they're only bringing this up now because they, 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 they haven't forgiven Boris for Brexit. And I also think... Um, as I said, if, if, the thing, if people think that the press conference earlier this week was bad, I would love to see some of the press conferences they had during the build-up to the Iraq war, where they were actually discussing bombing Iraq and, and Afghanistan, and uh, people's lives were on the line, British lives, civilian lives were on the line. You know, um, I'm sure they had very similar uh, 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 discussions back then. You know, The problem is here, uh, George, is that, uh, and of course, with, with, with regards to Julian Assange, that's another question altogether. The man revealed this line between fiction and reality, and he's been effectively persecuted for it, which is so unfair in every way. Um, I think the, the biggest problem here, we can put guys like Boris, Blair and Cameron come and go all the time. It's the same in America. Guys like Trump, Bush, Obama, and currently Biden come and go all the time. But the biggest problem and the biggest enemy of the truth is journalism. Uh, uh, the, the current, the current uh, uh, what they call journalism. It's not journalism. Uh, the press pack journalism, as they call it, is the biggest enemy of democracy ever. You know? and it's, it's, uh, well, I'm going to stop you, Simon. And the reason I'm going to stop you is <laughs> that is the best call, not just of the night, but many a night. It is an absolutely brilliant observation uh, about that line uh, that uh, professional wrestlers must never cross of telling people that essentially it's all a game. It's all rigged. The metaphor was so perfect. I can't let you go on any further in case you spoil it because it was just devastatingly brilliant. Thanks for making that call. Let's hear from Alison also in London, but on Assange. Go ahead, Alison. Good evening, George. Good evening. I was in the court on Friday oh. and uh, witnessed the absolute um, aberration of justice 
um, when uh, Holyrood, uh, the Lord Chief Justice Ian Burnett, was not present. He couldn't be present that day, um, Holyrood said. And when he said um, solemn diplomatic assurances, he wanted to guffaw out loud. Um, I reached the conclusion that now we're at, we are all Assange. It's a phrase that's mo- really appropriate for us because we've rapidly lost all of our rights and the most fastest laws are being introduced um, to restrict our freedoms, um, the police crime and sentencing bill, etc. And um, Julian actually is a symbol for our lives now, and we need to turn around and support him as much as we can. And you may be able to tell from my accent that I'm Australian, and I do a protest every Wednesday at the Australian High Commission in the Strand in London. Um, what time? What stress. time do you do it, Alison? I do it at three, three to five p.m. And often we doorstep George Brandis, who is a QC. He was the Attorney General of Australia at one time, and. Uh, we often ask him and demand that he act to get Julian Assange released. That's and, on a Wednesday uh, between 3 and 5? 3 to 5 outside Australian High Commission in the Strand. I yeah. hope people join you there. If I was in London, I'd do so myself. Uh, let me take the opportunity to ask you, is this a big issue in Australia or are the Australians uh, laconically shrugging it all off? It's become a very big issue. When John Shipton, Julian's father, had a, a roadshow tour to, uh, in Australia, people were coming out in the streets and, and throwing, giving him money um, to support Julian's case. Um, Aboriginal elders in Australia uh, gave um, Julian an Aboriginal passport and um, they are right behind him. There is a groundswell of support. The opposition party, the Labor Party, have said um, they will free Assange if they get into power. But forget the uh, Liberal, uh, which is a Conservative Party in Australia, um, uh, are up for an elect- re-election in the next six months. So Very interesting. I'm grateful there. to you for that, Alison. Good luck with your weekly picket. Let me go to Chantel in Berkmanstead on Tony Blair. Have you got news, mm-hmm. Chantel, on Tony Blair? Oh, we're hoping uh, that you will provide us some news, uh, George. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, I'm sitting here with my partner Carl. He's a regular listener of yours. And greetings to both of you. I get, I get the pleasure of hearing you. Yep, yeah, from the kitchen or the living room or wherever. Um, we were just, you know, delighted to hear your conversation before on, on Julian Assange, and thank you actually for bringing that to attention of uh, many people. And one of our, there was something that you mentioned, and one of our questions was uh, whether it was Tony Blair who sold the UK sold to the devil, and the devil being the United States of America in this case? Uh, Yes, uh, I think that's a decisive uh, junction, uh, the premiership of Tony Blair. The British had, prior to that, a kind of higher sense of themselves as not just an independent and sovereign country, but a former great power, uh, so that, for example, Uh, when Ronald Reagan, absurdly rather, invaded the tiny Commonwealth country of Grenada, uh, Mrs. Thatcher called him and uh, and boxed his ears over the telephone. She was mortified that the Queen had been insulted in this way uh, by the American president, supposedly a friend and ally of hers, invading a Commonwealth country, the head of state of which was the British Queen, without even a by your leave, without even notice uh, that he was going to do that. So even Thatcher uh, had uh, some sense of dignity about uh, Britain's place in the world. That, I think, died at the the juncture of uh, Tony Blair's premiership. He saw himself, though, let me add this context or colour, as uh, when, when he had to share the stage with George Bush as the president's brain. Prior to that, he was in double harness with his alter ego, really, Bill Clinton. They were so similar in so many ways, some of which I can't really tell you. Uh, but the, uh, the change of the guard in Washington to a blithering idiot, to an imbecile, George W. Bush, Uh, meant that Blair could pretend to himself that he was 
Greece to America's Rome, the brains uh, uh, atop the brawn of the United States. But I do think something very significant and fatal changed uh, during the premiership of Tony Blair. And it was his minister, David Blunkett, who, of course, uh, concluded in secret during the summer so that Parliament could not uh, uh, criticise it, uh, this unequal extradition treaty with the United States, which has led to this travesty over Julian Assange. George, just, just a quick um, comment on a few things you said. Uh, too, too much to go into many questions because I know the time. But when you said that um, Blair is like Clinton, was he a passenger on the Lita Express? No, but he was in the Black Book, and his, uh, his amanuensis, Peter Mandelson, was, of course, well, how shall I put it, a bosom buddy of uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And then, and also, given that he's, um, Blair's still got his uh, fingers in many pies in, in this government and across the world through his Institute for Global Change, I mean, will we see him ever, his influence ever disappear? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, he's, uh, he's more powerful now than he's ever been, mm. and he doesn't have to face questions <laughs> twice a week in Parliament, or perhaps more crucially, register just how filthy rich he is from all the sordid contracts that he has concluded since leaving office. Chantel, my regards to you and your partner. Let me try and squeeze in Gary in Belfast. Go ahead, Gary. Good evening to you, George. I'm very happy to be squeezed in. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to make a point or two about the current debacle con concerning our Prime Minister. Um, I like to dwell on um, points that maybe aren't um, being focused on in the, the current political discourse. I, I would like to draw attention to the fact that it seems apparent that most of the mandarins, or a lot of the mandarins in Downing Street and Whitehall, the civil servants, they, they seem to be gunning for the Prime Minister, and um, they've got an axe to grind with this government. And it's going to be very difficult for this government to operate when, it, when the, the, the press are hounding them and the, the civil service have got it in for them. So I think this government, which um, is probably deluding itself that it's going to have maybe a, a calmer 2022, mm. it's just lurching from one crisis to the next yeah. because um, the knives are out for, for the government, and, and especially for the Prime Minister. And, of course, as you know, he, he's really bringing it on himself. Well, again, that's brilliantly observed. Uh, the reasons for it are uh, not altogether wholesome from my point of view. Uh, the, the deep state doesn't like Boris Johnson because uh, of Brexit. The media doesn't like Boris Johnson because of Brexit. Uh, the biggest magnates of finance and industry don't like Boris Johnson because of Brexit. Uh, uh, but that's not what's going to bring them down, of course. That's practically, from my point of view, the only decent thing uh, that he has done. What's going to bring them down is the sense amongst conservatives uh, that he is leading them to disaster, that he is cascading across the political scene uh, wildly and in an uncontrolled way. Boris Johnson is a wretched individual. I know him well. Uh, he's the sort of man you'd be utterly horrified if you learned that your daughter uh, had accepted uh, an invitation to a date with him. You certainly would not allow him to drive your wife home from the office party. You wouldn't leave the biscuit tin unattended in his presence. You might not even leave your wallet in his presence. He is a wretched, bounder, cad of a man who, as I said right at the beginning, should have been horsewhipped out of public life a very, very long time ago. Now we've got the one and only Rachel Blevins coming up next from the United States. And then it's your calls all the way to the end of the show, more or less. I think, at least the last time I looked.
Radio Sputnik News. The UK's coronavirus alert level has been raised from three to four due to the spread of Omicron, the UK's chief medical officers have said. The last time that the UK was at level four was in May. Prime Minister Boris Johnson is due to make a televised statement on COVID any moment now. He's expected to provide an update on the booster programme, but it's not uh, expected that any new rules will be announced. On Sunday evening, the chief medical officers for England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland said they were recommending the alert level is raised from three to four, signifying that COVID is spreading fast. Risks are measured by a five-tier level. Colour-coded system level four means a high or rising level of transmission. That system is separate and independent from any government decisions on easing or tightening rules. In their statement, the chief medical officers said early evidence shows that the Omicron variant is spreading much faster than Delta and that vaccine protection against symptomatic disease from Omicron is reduced. The first people in the UK have now been admitted to hospital with Omicron infections. The new variant of the coronavirus now accounts for a third of cases in London, the Education Secretary Nadeem Zahawi said. He added that two doses of a vaccine were not enough and he encouraged people to get a booster jab. As of yesterday, there have been 1,898 confirmed cases of the variant in the UK, but the true number is likely to be far higher. Scientists from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine have warned that the UK will face a substantial wave of Omicron infections with further restrictions beyond the Plan B measures announced last week. These include recommending people work from home if they can, expanding mask wearing rules and introducing COVID passes for entry to some venues with Parliament to vote on the changes on Tuesday. Dr Susan Hopkins, Chief Medical Advisor for the UK Health Security Agency, said that she expected to see an increase in the number of people in hospital with Omicron infections. She said there had not been a report of a death from the variant in the UK yet, although she pointed out that it had only been identified two weeks ago. She added that it was inevitable that there was going to be a big wave of infections, but what was not clear was the impact it would have on hospitals. New COVID restrictions could be introduced in Scotland next week, the Deputy First Minister has warned. John Swinney said the Scottish Government is, quote, wrestling with the challenge of the surge of the Omicron variant. New self-isolation rules have come into force as Scotland recorded 4,087 new COVID cases on Saturday. All household contacts of someone with the virus should now isolate for 10 days regardless of vaccination status. Swinney said that the Scottish Government would spend the weekend deciding what to do next. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has accused Boris Johnson of breaking the law after a picture appeared of the Prime Minister in a Christmas quiz sitting between two colleagues in number 10 last year. At the time, indoor household mixing was banned in London. The Sunday Mirror newspaper published the picture of Johnson at the event, which it said was on December the 15th. Downing Street said he, quote, briefly took part virtually to thank staff for their work during the pandemic. Starmer said the event had created fury and that trust in the Prime Minister was at an all-time low. He said, quote, he is the worst possible leader at the worst possible time. It comes after the government launched an investigation into three allegations of gatherings last Christmas, including two in Downing Street, despite COVID rules banning them. In the photo, Johnson is sitting in the number 10 library between a colleague wearing a tinsel scarf and another apparently in a Santa hat. The G7 group of rich countries has warned Russia of a, quote, massive consequences if it invades Ukraine. UK Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, speaking after a summit in Liverpool, said that the group wanted Russia to stop its aggression towards Ukraine. However, President Putin told President Biden during their video call last week that Russian troops did not pose a threat to anyone, Russia media reports. Putin added that he had no particular grounds for optimism after speaking to Biden, but would like to meet him in person, local media quoted a Kremlin spokesperson as saying. Ukrainian authorities have claimed Moscow could be planning a military offensive at the end of January. A desperate search is underway for survivors in parts of six U.S. states devastated by powerful tornadoes that have left at least 83 people dead.
Dozens more people are missing and entire towns were destroyed by about 30 tornadoes on Friday. President Biden has declared a disaster in Kentucky, the worst affected state. More than 70 people have died in the state, including dozens in a candle factory, and the death toll is expected to rise above 100. 40 people have been rescued from the collapsed candle factory in Mayfield, but 60 remain missing. And Kentucky Governor Andy Beshear, who has visited the scene, said it was unlikely there were more survivors. A bishop in Spain has had his clerical powers removed following his marriage to an author of erotica with alleged satanic undertones. The Diocese of Solsona, where Xavier Novel Goma has been serving as a bishop, issued a statement on Saturday that said Novel is now forbidden from administering the sacraments and engaging in any teaching, although he can still maintain his status as a bishop. According to the statement, Novel Bishop Emeritus of Sultana entered into a civil marriage with Sylvia Caballol on November the 22nd, 2021. According to reports, Novel has supported gay conversion therapy and has also carried out exorcism. Caballol, who is 38, began her career as a novelist in 2015, according to a profile on the website of her publisher. She is trained in clinical psychology as well as sexology and yoga, the profile says. Formula One racing driver Max Verstappen has won his first world championship, overtaking Lewis Hamilton on the last lap and depriving the British driver of his eighth title. The race was restarted with one lap to go with Verstappen on fresh tyres and Hamilton on old ones and the Dutchman swept past Hamilton to win the race and the world title. At the end of the race, while Verstappen screamed with delight and his Red Bull team celebrated, Hamilton sat in his Mercedes for several minutes, disbelieving at the way events had turned against him in the final minutes. And finally, a photo belonging to a Kentucky family was found nearly 130 miles away in Indiana after the series of tornadoes which tore through several US states. On Saturday morning, a woman in Indiana noticed an old photo stuck to the window of her car. Katie Poston tweeted, quote, walked out to my car in New Albany and found this picture stuck to the window, undoubtedly from a home that was struck by the tornado that ripped through Kentucky last night. She added, hoping to find its owners, it looks like it reads Gertie Swatzel and JD Swatzel 1942. Please retweet. A member of the Swatzel family living in Dawson Springs, Kentucky, contacted Poston the same day, who then tweeted that she was making plans to return the photo. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. So extra time for callers this evening, but you need to dial now 08081 96 if you're in the United Kingdom. It's entirely free. If you're in the US, plus one, 844 Get your calls in now. Now, my RT America colleague, Rachel Blevins, is always our number one go-to on events across the Atlantic, and I'm glad to say she joins us again. Now, Rachel, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. Last week, it looked like war uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, Ukraine, of course, being able to count on American military backing. Then there was a Zoom conference uh, between President Biden and President Putin. This weekend, it doesn't look so likely. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it sure is ironic how all of a sudden President Biden got on that phone call and just fixed everything, at least. That's kind of what the media is leading you to believe. They are really running with this narrative that Biden got on the phone with Putin. They talked for a few hours. He talked tough and then Putin backed down. Now, the only problem with that narrative is that if you pay attention 
to how this scene has unfolded, you realize that Russia has been saying for weeks now that they have no plans to invade Ukraine. And yet it's people within the Biden administration, it's top mainstream networks here that have carried on this narrative and almost made it as if it is believable, only to then come up to the point where you have Biden getting on this phone call and coming in and fixing the entire situation. And I think it just goes to show how ridiculous the media has become at this point that they have literally created something out of thin air. They've pushed the narrative that they want to push and they've ignored Russia's response to it all the way through because they know that the average American is not going to actually do their research. The average American is not going to take the time to say, well, wait a second, what is Russia doing here? What do they have to gain from it versus what is Ukraine doing? And of course, the biggest question of all of this, why is the United States getting involved in a conflict like this? Why is the U.S. ramping up the aid, the weapons that it's sending to Ukraine? And how does that serve American interest? Yeah, they created a straw man in order to knock that straw man down. They pretended that Russia was about to invade Ukraine. And when it doesn't, they want to claim the credit for that. It's an old story, really, Rachel. That it is. And it is interesting to see the fact that Biden is at the center of all of this, because at the end of the day, we remember when Donald Trump was in office, there was such a push for him to be tough on Russia. And the way that they did it was by saying, well, Russia wanted Trump to win. So then Trump comes into office and he feels like he's really got to stand up to Russia. And now Biden has a version of that. But there's also this pressure on him to look tough. And, you know, the media really doesn't they don't want to talk about all of the U.S. failures in the Middle East anymore. Instead, now they're making this pivot towards China and Russia. And it is incredibly concerning when we look at the fact that this week, Congress passed their defense spending bill for 2022 to the tune of $768 billion. That's $25 billion more than Biden actually asked for and more than the Pentagon asked for. And yet, when you look at the fact that the U.S., says that it is ramping down its involvement in the Middle East, you really wonder, why are we adding to the defense budget? Why are we giving more money to Ukraine to ramp up tensions there? Why are we increasing U.S. involvement in the Indo-Pacific and increasing those tensions with China? I mean, what good is that doing? And why isn't there more talk about it at the end of the day? It's welfare for capitalism, isn't it? Because more than half of that staggering or eye-watering sum goes in procurement to the military industrial complex, some of which is given back in kickbacks, some of it is given back in campaign contributions, some of it is given back in revolving door appointments, uh, etc. Uh, once people leave office, once they leave government service, uh, the uh, poor bloody infantry, the service personnel, got a uh, a wage increase out of that budget, which is much less than your rate of inflation. Your rate of inflation yeah. is now at more or less uh, recent record levels. And the troops got, I think, 2.5%. So actually they got a pay cut out of this new <laughs> mega uh, military budget. Tell us about the inflation. I saw you've been right. writing and talking about it. Yeah, that is an excellent point there to look at. I mean, them giving the troops two and a half percent, that is almost laughable. And you're right, here in the United States, inflation is at nearly 40 year highs. That's what it reached last month. And we're seeing that all around in every part of our daily lives, whether it's just going to the grocery store, whether it's putting gas in your car. And yet we have a Federal Reserve, a central bank in this country that has done this on purpose. They started it at the beginning of the pandemic when they looked at the fact that the U.S. was going to be going into unprecedented lockdowns. They looked at the fact that our production was going to be halted in a lot of ways. And so they said, OK, we'll print more money. We'll make it so that, you know, we keep pumping more money into the economy as if it was going to be good for the American people, as if it was going to be good for the dollar. Well, the problem is that even though more Americans are getting back to work, even though you have unemployment at record lows, they actually haven't stopped pumping that money into the economy. Instead, you have these central bank officials sitting there and saying, oh, well, we'll taper it a little bit each month. We'll still keep interest rates at record lows. 
and we'll just continue this. Well, the problem is that you've got Americans who are now paying more than ever in their daily lives. And yet, even with all of the people talking about how the Americans coming back to work got extra bonuses or they got a little bit more in their hourly salary, well, that's not enough to set off the 40 year highs that we're seeing when it comes to inflation. And it really is this rising bubble that if the Biden administration doesn't truly have to deal with it, well, it's going to have to be dealt with down the road. We always joke about Congress passing their spending bills every few months as if they are kicking the can down the road. Well, that's what they're doing, but it is a very, very dire situation. No, it never rains, but it pours. And you had these awful uh, uh, tornadoes uh, this week. I saw some pictures of towns that looked like they'd been uh, in a war, or in fact, looked like the United States had just bombed them. Yeah, yeah, it is truly tragic in that. I mean, it just, it felt like it came overnight. I know the state of Kentucky is saying that this is the worst tornado that they've ever seen. It's feared that at least 100 people could be dead. And you're talking about tornadoes that swept across several states, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Mississippi, those were all among them. And I know that this is a situation where, you know, here in the United States, unfortunately, it takes severe weather for us to really come together, band together, and then make those necessary remedies where that's needed. And we've already seen a lot of volunteers on the ground and obviously they are going to do everything that they can but it serves as a reminder of the importance of our infrastructure here in this country because at any given time i mean this is a country that routinely sees hurricanes tornadoes you name it i know i'm from north texas and so we don't usually see tornadoes quite like this but you do get used to those storms every single year and it serves as a reminder that the government has to take infrastructure seriously because you get into a situation like this and really they are no match for mother nature at the end of the day. No, nobody is. Rachel, thanks very much for joining us. A very busy show this evening. Uh, I hope we get uh, an opportunity to talk uh, longer. Can I take some calls? Let's go to David in London. David, welcome. Welcome, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, George. Good evening. George, I just had a bit of an issue with um, where you've got Ghislaine Maxwell. Yeah. And recently in the media, it was reported that um, the, uh, the, the defence for Ghislaine Maxwell, they wanted to bring forward um, witnesses, key witnesses, in her defence. However, all of those witnesses that she wanted to bring forward on the stand in the jury in New York all of them wanted anonymity to, in order to provide her with support on the witness stand. How is that possible? And did they get it? No. Well, at the moment, it's actually been, it's actually been, um, there's actually been deliberated by the judge. But my point, I think, is if you have friends in high places who really support you that much, surely they're willing to do that publicly and not under the guise of anonymity. Who'd want to be associated with the sordid gang of sex traffickers around Jeffrey Epstein? David, thanks. A very interesting call. Burkhard is in Switzerland. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, sir. Hi, good evening, George. How are you? Evening. Thank you for calling. What would you like to say? Um, I wanted to comment um, on the uh, discussion that took place last week between you and Mr. Mansfield about the vaccination mandate, <clears throat> I was I was a bit surprised. You know, there was uh, you know it seemed to me a rather um, uh, simple simple approach. He said, you know, if there's a possible benefit to the vaccination, then let's go ahead and do it. And you know, he, he sort of put this comparison with the seat belts uh, you know, on the table, and that to me seemed not really appropriate because. There's obviously people. Well, you don't. You, people don't, you have, don't put a, a, a you don't put a seatbelt or a crash helmet into your body. Yeah, that's exactly the point, you know. But it seemed to me it wasn't really discussed about the fears, I suppose, or the uncertainty that people have about the vaccination. Yeah, I, I was a bit surprised uh, as a human rights uh, QC uh, that he took the uh, line that he did, and so were a lot of people, I think. Right. But his, yeah, is well. the his is the prevailing orthodoxy. It's the orthodoxy in which 
Uh, the government and the state are headed, I think, certainly so far as vaccine passports are concerned. They're not yet at the stage of compulsory vaccination in Britain, but they are in Austria, for example. Yes, yes. Yes, next door, is, uh, next door to you. It, it, What's the attitude of the Swiss? <laughs> well, uh, Switzerland is a, is a country that uh, has, I think, something like 33, 35 percent unvaccinated. And, you know, there's at least a fair number of people that are relatively conscientious of, uh, you know, of, of the situation. And also, let's say they do not like, uh, you know, compulsory measures. So, you know, there's a... That's a high of level of unvaccinated people, isn't it? Um, well, yes, yes, it is. But, um, you know, I suppose, you know, people are just, uh, you know, not... People just don't have the confidence in, in, in the government being forthright with what they are doing. If you Join look the at club. the statistics... Join the club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, you've got a government... We've got a government that... Hardly anybody trusts. Thanks for the call. Uh, Sean is in Stevenage. Let's hear from Sean. Go ahead. Hey, up, George. How are you doing? Good, sir. Thanks for calling. What would you like to say? Uh, just picking up on... I thought your monologue was one of the best you've done for a long time. Hitting Thank on you. a lot of subjects close to my heart here. Thank you. And uh, particularly picking up on the vaccine stuff and the government's lies and hypocrisy through this whole nearly two years, really. Um, while your show was on, we had we sort of put Boris's pronouncement on as well in the background. Yeah, how was he? Honest, was he impressive? No, not at all. Not at all. It's scaremongering. He didn't and fill you opinion, with confidence then? No, 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 no. Um, throughout the whole talk, just just being specific on that, on this, this Omicron thing, which, incidentally, I've seen uh, Dr. Angelique could see his pronouncements on this, on how it's, <laughs> it's, it's much milder. Uh, well, we'll need to try and get her on, if I can say that to my colleagues behind yeah. the glass, because uh, she was on a local uh, London radio station today, uh, and oh. uh, I heard it. Uh, she was very powerful in saying that this panic is unnecessary. It's yeah. actually milder. It's a tidal wave, says uh, Boris. It's a tsunami, says Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, but the uh, impact... Of, uh, of Omicron is less deadly, much less, she said, than yep. the Delta variant. And as some commentators have said, possibly even beneficial, because if every, more people get a much milder illness, then you'll have antibodies. What's the need for the vaccines? But I think the government is trying to scaremonger people and stampede them but why? into getting the but COVID But why, vaccine. Sean? This is what I always okay. struggle with. The ultimate thing, I think, is to get as many people vaccinated so they have vaccine certification because the aim is COVID passports, which is, in my but what, opinion... Why, what, just, but why? Let me ask, why again? What, what's what, in it for them, COVID passports? We probably need a lot longer to talk about what I think the ramifications there are. But I think it's, it's to do with being able to control, uh, monitor, surveil and have electronic records of That's, transactions. You've lost me. You've you lost go. me, Sean. They've already got all that long ago. They've long ago already got all that. And why they would want to control Sean in Stevenage or even me in Scotland, I, I really uh, don't grasp. But thanks for the call. Uh, Ignacio is in Madrid. Let's hear from him. Hi. Yeah. Good evening, George. Good evening. Um, I, I rang tonight to speak about Julian Assange again. Yeah. Um, well, it's uh, it's terrible. And uh, if you recall, last time I, I rang to speak about this, uh, I mentioned that this is a perversion of the legal system. Uh, because he has been prosecuted for abiding by the law, which uh, requires you to, to report a crime of which you yeah. have knowledge. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Uh, but uh, today I wanted to relate um, all this uh, issue with some, something that you discussed last week, which is the, the Cold War uh, with Russia and, and China and um, Iran at the moment. And um, I'm sure we agree that this, uh, this hostility that is being created with Russia and China has nothing to do with communism or human rights. <clears throat> um, it, it's all about um, imperial hegemony. 
um, on the basis that, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> on the basis that, um, you know, there's other communist countries with which there is no, <coughs> beg your pardon, there is no Cold War, like Leo, for instance. Uh, but it's only China and North Korea that are on the, on the target. And that is because they are superpowers or nuclear powers. Um, so the, the point, George, what these two interrelate is an issue of democratic accountability. And for that, I mean that people need to demand their politicians that this case be dropped, that this, this uh, appeal um, is taken into consideration, and that they stop warmongering around the world. Well, uh, I've got to tell you uh, that uh, appeals to the British political class uh, would uh, undoubtedly fall on stony ground, uh, on deaf ears. In any case, uh, the courts are uh, separate from the, the parliamentary process. We're in the hands of, at this moment in time, uh, the judges uh, who are appointed for life and cannot be influenced. Uh, and so we're stuck in that cycle at the moment. The last decision, God forbid if it comes, will be a decision by the Home Secretary, uh, at which point politicians will be pressurable. Uh, but I, I'm afraid I'm, um, I'm, I've got more faith in judges than I have in parliamentarians, and that's saying something. Thanks for the call, Ignacio. Here's Peter in Chicago. Go ahead, Peter. Hi, George. Hi, nice to hear from you. What do you want to say? First of all, I say my deepest respect to you and your lovely wife, everything what you do. Thank you so the much. Respect, Very kind. The respect I have only to my parents as absolutely as equal as to your family. Oh, well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I really want to hear about your opinion. Uh, as soon as I heard about that Omicron variant, yeah. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not right or... Well, I, I'm, not no. a sci I'm not a scientist, Peter, uh, but I did hear a doctor who discovered One. it say very clearly that all this panic was unwarranted because it actually may well be a good thing because it passes very quickly, uh, but, but passes through you very quickly without doing nearly as much damage as uh, other variants do. Uh, and uh, I'm impressed by that point of view. But I've got a prime minister calling it a tidal wave. I've got a first minister in Scotland calling it a tsunami. Uh, so people are tonight very afraid, Peter. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Uh, I think finally Mother Nature took the matter of their hands and uh, maybe that's the way... The only way uh, the poor people in Africa and everywhere around the world are going to be naturally building their immune system with the antibodies and uh, finally all those things is over. I believe uh, somehow Mother Nature is kind of helping the humanity this way because it's more contagious, it's not that seriously deadly. That's what I was thinking well, I pray, think about it. I, I pray that that is true. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, for the call, Peter, uh, but I've got some breaking news. It's actually quite <laughs> stupendous breaking news. After last week's record-breaking week for the Moats podcast, you'll remember I told you about it, we've got news of more records broken. Now, I remind you that last week was our biggest ever week, and this week our figures are up an unbelievable 28%. That's from our highest figure, we're now 28% higher than that. We've got new listeners in El Salvador. Hola. And we are charting in 21 countries. So once again, we've broken the daily listener record. And if you're not listening to this growing worldwide sensation, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so you can listen to Moats anywhere, anytime from every corner of the earth. And don't forget to share with all your friends and leave us, please, a five-star review on Apple Podcasts because that is one of the ways to grow. Now, let's take uh, what is the last question of the night. In 1961, in this week, 
The Beatles signed a contract to be managed by Brian Epstein. What was the name of the place in which it was signed? A, NEMS, N-E-M-S, B, Looney Tunes, C, The Cavern. It's all coming up after the break. Radio Sputnik. Hey you, do you want to know more of what's happening in the world right now? Of course you do. But getting to the heart of the story, well, that's going to take some hard work. That's why here at the mother of all talk shows, we've created that program just for you. Hosted by one of the world's most sagacious minds. Get a perspective, an education on stories from all around the world, dissected and discussed with you. Join our debate, vote in our polls on Twitter, tweet a question to George, or call in now to give us your perspective on the stories the rest of the world simply isn't talking about. Join the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. Hosted by one of the world's greatest orators, the mother of all talk shows, with George Galloway. Let's make sense of the world together. Sputnik has been launched to give you a closer look at everything happening in the world. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. The answer is NEMS, N-E-M-S, which was the Epstein family record shop. I'm watching the... Uh, it's on Disney, actually, the six-hour documentary. I've not watched it all, obviously, but I watched the first hour. I found it extremely interesting uh, about the making of what was the last public appearance of the Beatles, what might uh, now be called the Get Back Tour, though it never went anywhere. It was fascinating on all kinds of levels. Uh, first of all, I was... Absolutely unaware that when the Beatles finished, Paul McCartney was 26. George, I think, was also 26. He might even have been younger. Ringo was, uh, was uh, 27. John was 28. These were still very young men with so much more to offer. Uh, but that was their last gig. And when you watch it, you can quite clearly see why. Uh, Bob Bishop says the government apologised for poor regulations that led to the Grenfell Tower disaster this week, hardly covered in the media. Paul Hodder says Tory MPs won't do to Boris what they did to Thatcher. Cut that out and keep it, Paul. Darth Mike says Omicron killed less people than Alec Baldwin. Cruel but true. Uh, Neil Russell says the civil service are the ones who run the show in the background. Doesn't matter what the politicians say. And Frank Walker says the problem is Boris Johnson controls Parliament and can do as he pleases. He's changing the rules to suit himself. Well, up to a point, Frank, but there comes a point at which that's no longer true. Luke Burgess says, George, we've seen more proof of fascism within this government than you have in religion. Don't call people idiots when they can see in pl plain sight clear fascism. When you rely on faith, not fact, in your beliefs, exercise a little decorum in the language you use. Decorum is my middle name, actually, Luke, and I'm not even sure what all of that bile actually meant. Now, Professor William Hogan is on the line from Florida. He's from Doctors for Assange, uh, joining us at uh, short notice, and I'm very grateful to you, Professor William Hogan. Thanks for joining us. I wanted to speak to you about the news that, on top of all the other trials and tribulations, Julian has now had a mini stroke. Do you think if the court had known about that, they might have made a, a different decision the other day in uh, the London High Court? Well, that's certainly hard to say. You would hope so. Um, if, he's, if he's not fit medically to um, attend the court hearing, how can he be fit medically to be extradited to the United States? 
How serious is a mini stroke? Generally, the, the, the consequences are not long lasting, but the risk is that it'll happen again and in a more severe way. It indicates he's got atherosclerosis of his arteries. This was what we call an ischemic event. Uh, therefore, it's a blockage of blood flow. Um, and he had a, an MRI done of his brain to make sure that there was no uh, permanent damage. Uh, but again, it indicates that uh, you know, these things don't happen in 50-year-old men normally. And the reason he's got this happening now is because he's being, he's being tortured in prison. And that level of stress results in, ather we know, it results in atherosclerosis of the arteries. He's probably also at risk for a heart attack now and other ischemic events. Now, some will think uh, you exaggerated there when you said he's being tortured in prison, but that was exactly how his situation was described by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on torture, wasn't it? That's correct. All the evidence that we have uh, with respect to torture is that he's being tortured. Four experts in the assessment of torture, uh, assessment of torture victims using the Istanbul Protocol, all have come to the same conclusion independently. That includes uh, Dr. Meltzer. He was accompanied to Belmarsh Prison to visit Julian by two doctors, two medical experts. They all interviewed Julian and examined him independently and then conferred afterwards. And they all said, yeah, it's conclusive. He didn't show most or many of the symptoms of torture. He showed all the symptoms of torture. Everyone who's examined uh, Mr. Assange as a victim of torture has come to the same conclusion. The evidence is conclusive, it's overwhelming, and it's unanimous. Why does your president want to see uh, a journalist tortured for words that he wrote and published? Wow. <laughs> That's hard to say. I think it's because he exposed wrongdoing by the government, wrongdoing that Mr. Biden himself participated in. Uh, Mr. Biden, as a senator, voted in favor of the Iraq war uh, and the war in Afghanistan. Um, and so I think he's probably implicated in some of the WikiLeaks releases. And so uh, he's covering up his own crimes. The CIA have, are desperate to, uh, to see Assange nailed down in a coffin, aren't they? Because some of the most dramatic disclosures that Julian and WikiLeaks made uh, were deeply embarrassing, uh, shaming of the CIA. That's right. So on several levels. So uh, the torture at Guantanamo. So there was the WikiLeaks releases, the Guantanamo files. That was used by a, a German citizen uh, to prove that he had been tortured when he got back. He was left with only his clothes released by the CIA at the border. He had to walk home. Um, and when he got back, his wife had returned to Lebanon. Um, and no one would believe his story about how brutally he had been tortured. Um, and then also Vault 7 releases. So the CIA was furious about the Vault 7 releases. We now know from reporting by Yahoo News, Michael Isikoff and his colleagues, that Mike Pompeo was so enraged by the Vault 7 releases that he started plots to assassinate Assange. And this went up to what Isikoff describes as the highest levels of the administration. And this is supported by over 30 sources they had. So yes, the CIA absolutely is out for vengeance. Vengeance is destructive. They're going to uh, break their toe, as it were. I'm trying to remember the exact expression. They're going to break their toe on Assange in a bad way. And the, the vengeance is self-destructive. And so the CIA is self-destructing on their vengeance on Assange. Professor, you're a, you're a, a physician yourself, an eminent one. Uh, as you look at Julian Assange and absorb the uh, material that uh, is there about his psychological and now physical health. It's unconscionable, isn't it, that you would extradite such a man uh, to, apart from anything else, it's so utterly disproportionate. Uh, you know, this is not a mass murderer. This is a man that published words. That's right. It is disproportionate. It's unconscionable. Um, 
it's beyond the pale. Um, it's, you know, from medically speaking, you know, it's, it's shocking to the conscience. And that's why we formed Doctors for Assange. And we have uh, over 250 doctors in the organization and we're speaking out against it. Professor, thanks for joining us at short notice. I really do uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, let me uh, look at this poll. Should Christmas be cancelled? Bit of a leading question, that. Uh, yes, say 11% of you. Yeah, seriously? And on YouTube, 25% of you say, yes, Christmas should be cancelled. On Telegram, 18%. What's wrong with you people? Matt is in London uh, on Assange. Let's hear Matt. Go ahead, Matt. Yes, hi, George. Uh, I wanted to talk about one particular aspect of the assurances. Yes. Um, now, the, judge, the judges claim, really, that they are basing their judgment on the assurances. Solomon but, binding. Yeah, but they say something different in paragraph 50 about the health assurance than they actually quote in paragraph 30. And the key thing is that they say in paragraph 50, which is the, the paragraph where they're making their case, that the U.S. has promised appropriate treatment. Um, but if you look again um, at what the U.S. actually said, the U.S. said that will ensure he gets any treatment as is recommended by a qualified person. So... It's much less. I mean, the, the it's a lesser a test. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's far worse. I mean, if he's in jail for decades, it's going to have a massive uh, difference. If you actually read what they actually said in the US, it's not really a guarantee of anything because if 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 treatment is not recommended, he doesn't get it. So you know, if you if you have a that's a very very good point. Uh, One that I hope uh, arises at the appeal. Frankly, my view, Matt, is anybody who accepts these assurances, I've got a bridge here in London that I could sell them. Going cheap. Thanks for the call, Matt. Cornelius is in Swansea. Let's hear from Wales. Don't often get uh, calls from Wales. Go on, Cornelius. Uh, George, Eamon, how are you? Yes, fine, thank you. I, um, if I may, may I me uh, just mention something after listening to your news bulletin? Yes. And what I quickly want to say, right, is that for the first time I've ever watched a Formula One race, all because Hamilton was going to beat Schumacher in the last race of the series, right? Lewis Not Hamilton, Schumacher, he was going to beat, what's sorry, his name? Verstappen. 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 Yeah. Correct, yeah. Lewis Hamilton is 11 and a half seconds in front of Verstappen with five laps to go. There was a car that lost control and went into the barriers, right? And nothing to do with the race. The safety car comes out. They restarted the race with Verstappen next to Lewis Hamilton. Forget the 11 and a half seconds he was in front. And because Verstappen had new tyres, he beat him at the end. I'd never seen such a scam in my life. How could that be, uh, how was, could that be within the rules? I do not understand, mate. I fell out with a friend of mine tonight, right, over the phone, right, because he's a big Formula One fan, right, and I've never watched it. Lewis Hamilton was 11 and a half seconds in front of Verstappen with five laps to go. It was impossible for him to lose the race. And yet, all of a sudden, a car that wasn't even involved in the race lost control, hit the barriers, the safety car came out, and all of a sudden, Hamilton's 11 and a half seconds went down the toilet. I've never seen anything like it, wow. George. I, I've Major got no interest in, uh, in Formula One, and I'm not a, a particular fan uh, of uh, the uh, conduct and, indeed, the taxation habits uh, of, uh, of Hamilton. Uh, but uh, as you George, describe it, it sounds uh, like a travesty. George, George, I didn't the reason why I phoned, but I thought I'd put it in. Yeah, what, yeah. He just said about, what he just said about Lewis Hamilton, I 100% agree with you with his tax havens and blah, blah, blah. But I'm on about the race itself. Yeah. I thought it was a bloody scam. Well, uh, anyway, as you describe it, it sounds almost unbelievable, yeah. That's a fact. But the yeah. reason, one of the reasons why I phoned... First of all, I really liked the opinion when he was speaking to that journalist about Julian Assange, in particular of uh, the family that lost a child with a woman that escapes back to America 
uh, as on um, grounds that she's a diplomat and they can't get her back into the country to face justice and a, and a, and a family have lost a child and they can't get justice with an American coming back to the UK. And yet Julia Sands is treating the way he's been treated. It's very hard to bear. Has. It's very hard it's to bear. Bit. Poor Harry uh, gets George no is justice. Disgraceful. Yeah. It's disgraceful. And finally, Matt, regarding you, Paul, with the Labour Party, I honestly think no matter what Boris Johnson does at the moment, it's too close after Brexit, right? It's still incomplete with fisheries and the Northern Ireland Protocol. And no matter what Boris Johnson does, the Labour Party ain't going to gain anything. No, they that's my view. I, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not changing my publicly stated view that they will never poll above 30% in any election ever again. And I haven't changed my mind on that. Cornelius, thanks for the call. Ian is in London in Hounslow. Uh, last days of Keir Starmer, thinks Ian. Go ahead, Ian. Yes, George. Uh, it's not the end of the days for Bodger. He'll, he'll survive this high tide mark of scandal because despite his constant failures, constant failures, Starmer has not been able to lay a glove on him. doesn't want and to. Was, he doesn't seem to well, want to. Yes, and it will show to those who are in complete denial that Starmer is a dud. Look, if I was leading the Labour Party, I would oppose Plan B in the House of Commons this week. I would say... Uh, Put me in power, I've got a better plan B. Uh, I'm not accepting yours. Uh, and I'd ally with the Tory rebels and I'd deal a devastating blow to Boris Johnson. That's what you're supposed to do as the leader of the opposition. He's doing the opposite. He's rescuing Boris in the lobbies this week. Plan B, that plan Boris, is it? Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. Ian, thanks for the call. Vince is in London. Go ahead, Vince. Oh, hello, Mr. Galloway. I'd just like to um, say uh, I'm very impressed with uh, all the work you're doing. Thank uh, you, sir. Uh, please excuse me. I'm politically a bit of a novice, but I have a question that keeps coming up for me, and you may be able to answer it. Okay. It's about um, the relationship between Julian Assange being extradited to the United States and Prince Andrew. Is there some kind of deal going on? Uh, with this, or am I just being naive? Well, I mean, this? it's uh, if, if there is a deal, it's unspoken, but it's not necessary. Uh, the British would never extradite uh, Prince Andrew to the United States, and frankly, the United States would never ask for that because that would cross uh, a red line that is really, frankly, not that important to cross for United States state interests. The justice for the poor girl, uh, Jufre, uh, is of very little importance to the deep state in the United States, certainly by comparison with uh, keeping close, uh, albeit vassal, relations uh, with, uh, with Great Britain in NATO, in AUKUS, and in all kinds of ways, Vince. Okay, uh, that, that really answers my question. It's thank just, you. It's just, um, thank you very much again. And, uh, you're and a gentleman. Best, Don't be a stranger. Please. Call us again. Mark is in Ayrshire. Go ahead, Mark. Hi there. Uh, I was just uh, wondering if uh, you were given or came across any evidence that was say, untoward against uh, the USA, would you be willing to put it forward or not after what has happened to Julian Assange as a reporter. You obviously don't know me, Mark, or you wouldn't need to ask that question. I would stand on this table and do it uh, in front of all these uh, cameras uh, because I'm afraid only of God, uh, the God that was ridiculed in an earlier communication. Uh, I'm not afraid of the United States or MI6 next door or MI5 next door, or MI6 across the way. I'm not afraid of anybody. So if, uh, if I got uh, material that I believed in all conscience was in the public's interest to uh, reveal, I would reveal it. E even with what's happened with uh, Julian yeah. Assange? Absolutely. Without, without uh -huh. a moment's hesitation. Unfortunately, uh -huh. unfortunately there are not many people in this profession uh, that uh, would take that view. And what happens is, as I said earlier, 
quoting Francis Bacon, self-censorship is the arrow that flies in the night. You don't see it. You will never know it. Uh, but the journalist didn't say or didn't write what he could have said uh, or would have written uh, because he censored himself. Well, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear it because it's so many uh, journalists, they, they cower, they, they yeah. will cower away from... Cowards, uh, that's where the word comes happen. from. Cowering, cowards. We've got cowards in the so-called fourth estate. We've got yeah. cowards yeah. in parliament. We've got cowards on the opposition front bench at a time when our country is in trouble and needs men and women of substance with courage and convictions. We have none uh, of that. Mark, thanks uh, very much for that call. Bob Bishop says, uh, no, I've done that one. Uh, Frank Walker, Luke Burgess. Then there was the insult uh, from Luke Burgess. Paul Dyer says, George, as far as I know, living up here, nobody wants HS2 in the north with its concomitant damage to ancient woodlands and existing residences. Surely anybody with any sense would prefer the money to be spent on hospitals and schools. Plenty of jobs in construction there with no disruption to people's lives. How about a poll asking who wants it? Maybe we will. And Bushman says, Boris is out of touch with the majority of those who voted for him on many issues. I'm certain that that is true. Uh, let's take Kenny in Acton. Well, it's a one for the money, a two for the show. Go ahead, Kenny. Good evening, George. How are you doing, OK? I hope I didn't steal the first lines of your call. No, I would like to sing a song at the end of the call, but before I do... Uh... You know, See, you thought I, I didn't like know it was say, you. I just like, I just like to say, I really love when I hear your sound technician bursting out laughing in the sound booth. If, every time I mention a song or start singing or something, it's great. <laughs> yeah, go on, Ken. Yes, it, this Julian Assange thing. Yeah. Uh, he never really released anything that was that damning or like had major consequences for well, anyone. I mean, did anybody well, spend any time in jail because of his leaks or have to resign no, or that? No, and nobody died either. So, uh, uh, the, well, the, the Guardian, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Le Monde, uh, all the big newspapers of the world published the things that he's <clears throat> in prison for giving them to publish. You couldn't yeah. make it up, Ken. I know. And the but they don't have the say... guts to prosecute The Guardian and The New York Times, see? And The Guardian and The New York Times don't have the guts to challenge yeah. them to do so. Uh -huh. They should be saying, well, Assange uh, published this material in our newspaper. So if you're in... prosecuting him, prosecute us. I know, it's shocking, you know. And then you've got Piers Morgan still walking the streets after tapping Millie Dowler's parents' phones. How does that work, you know? Well, all these uh, journalists that hack the phones are walking <clears throat> free. Not one of them did time. Aye, I know. Give us a few bars, because uh, I've got lots of calls still coming in. OK, this song goes out to Pretty Patel. Don't feel disheartened that Boris Johnson cancelled your Christmas. Little girl, you look so lonesome. I see you're feeling blue. Ain't no use in staying at home. I know what you should do. Do 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 do. Come on over to my place. Oh, hey, girl, we're having a party. No, no, we'll it's a quiz night. It's a quiz night. And singing. Won't you come on over tonight? Thank you, Kenny. Thank you for that. Brilliant. Jamie is in Malaga uh, on Assange. Go ahead, Jamie. Good evening, George. Uh, thanks very much for taking my call. Welcome. Um, it's been a very interesting program, as always, and Thank I'm you. really glad to see you've had a lot of calls and, and, and spoken a lot about uh, Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. uh, my message is really very brief. I mean, I'm absolutely appealed at the judgment uh, that has been passed down. Shameful uh, and with... inexplicable, Jimmy. Absolutely disgusting. I mean, how they can 
send Julian to a country that has already revealed that there were plots in the CIA to assassinate him is absolutely appalling. And the poor chap we now hear has suffered a stroke. I'm absolutely disgusted by it and ashamed of, uh, of our sort of judicial system and political system in the UK. It's, it, you it's and all me, wrong. And it, you and it me both. To stop. You and me both, yeah, no, Jamie. Thank, thank you so much, George, no, for everything thank you. you're doing. God bless you. Uh, let's take Barry in Nottingham. Go ahead, Barry. Oh, hi, George. Uh, just a quick question. I'm fairly sure that Maggie Thatcher wasn't a particular favourite politician of yours. That's just a guess, of course. Um, but would you rate her high, highly, more highly than the current Prime Minister? Uh, well, it depends what you mean. I mean, of, of course, of, uh, um, if you're talking about their politics, then obviously I'd prefer uh, Boris to Thatcher. Thatcher uh, wrecked the industrial heartland from which I spring uh, in this yes. country. Yeah, she destroyed yeah. uh, labour movement organisations that had taken a hundred years to build. Uh, she was uh, cruel and vindictive uh, in her uh, treatment, for example, of the, of the political prisoners in Ireland and so on. Uh, so obviously, I'd rather have Boris than her. But if you're asking me about levels of competence, uh, then they're not in the same league. Uh, Thatcher knew uh, what to do with the levers of government, with the sinews of power, and could carry out her wicked way uh, efficiently. Boris Johnson is a shambles, a total shambles. Yeah. So you wouldn't regard her as having principles, that's what I'm saying. Uh, she did have principles. Uh, I just happen to believe those principles were dastardly. Uh, Boris yeah. has no yeah. principles at all. Yeah. The only principle he has is uh, his own advancement. And that's been true yeah. uh, since he was a public schoolboy. Thanks, yeah. uh, thanks, Barry. I've got to clear the lines because we've got a legend called Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Um, just a few questions. Um, why do you think Boris had to give the announcement tonight. I mean, surely he could have given it tomorrow on a weekday. And you see, do you think he's on paternity leave? Because um, he might not be in Parliament to answer the Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday. Do you think that... It's a happen? good question. Uh, I think the first part of the answer is virtually automatic. It's distraction. Uh, they are desperate about footage and yeah. uh, WhatsApp messages that are still out there, which reveal their uh, absolute hypocrisy. Uh, last Christmas, uh, they realize that they have, uh, they have lost a lot of political authority and power as a result of those revelations, and they're terrified of more. Uh, they've got a very difficult by-election coming up on yeah. Thursday. And so this was a distraction. Yeah, well, Sunday night. I heard Dominic Greaves speaking on a radio program, and um, my God, he wasn't that strong against Boris. It was really, um, I was amazed how strong he was. Well, he was the champion of Remain, of course. Uh, yeah, I know he, he was. was the, uh, he was the main saboteur uh, of uh, Brexit, and he's one of those that has never forgiven Boris, uh, for, no. for Brexit. No. And the last thing, just on Julian Assange, I mean, I'm probably far too naive about this, but all this dreadful outcome at the courts, do you think, well, you don't, but I, why couldn't he be given um, bail, tags, and sent home till the um, final outcome came? Exactly. Surely or, that would be or, pain. Or, or given a tag and sent to, uh, to a health farm, uh, to a sanatorium. Uh, they, could, uh, they could post guards on the door. Why has he got to be kept in Belmarsh, yeah, which is for mass murderers, terrorists, not for a guy who's on trial or not even yet on trial, for having written words on a typewriter, words that were printed on the front pages of the biggest newspapers in the whole world. Norma, thanks. It's been marvellous for me. Hope it was for you.
come back next week, same time, same place.